Welcome to a meeting of the California Paraprofessional Program Working Group. I can start by taking roll. Uh, Bashan. Uh, Reynoldson. Here. Falmouth. Here, here. <laughs> uh, Fleischman. Here. Hamilton. Present. Um, I believe Judge Harper is going to be late. Right. Um, um, Hartston. Here. Kirkmeyer. Here. McRae. Here. Olvera. Here. Justice Petru. Here. Robinson. Judge Rubin, I think you said is not joining us. Um, Shining. I think Carolyn said she might be a little bit late. Um, Sarush. Here. Spiro. Here. Torres Ambriz. Present. Uh, Judge Wiley. Present. Judge Yu. I'm here, thank you. Thank you. Okay. So um, I, there's really not a chair's report for this because we're focused on a couple of subject matter areas. Um, Linda just kindly circulated an email to everyone regarding the naming process, which is ongoing and there'll be more to come. Um, Leah, shall we start with family today? Yeah. Do we wanna ask if there's any public comment? Let's see here. Hold on one second. Could I ask I... that we take public comments as to family only and then leave yeah. public comments to housing to that section? That's fine. Um, I'm not seeing any name hands so far. If there are any attendees who wish to make public comment in regards to family, if you could, I see one hand. So Linda, if you could please um, allow Angela to speak. Okay. And do you want to set a limit of three minutes? Three minutes. Okay. Okay. Hello, everyone. Hi. Hello, Angela. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, of course, thank you for all the work that y'all do. So, um, one of the things that I would like to discuss or get more feedback on, and I wish I could participate later while y'all are in the middle of a discussion, but anywho, you know, so one of the issues is, you know, terminating spousal support for long-term marriages, you know, whether or not a paraprofessional will be able to do that. Um, now, I understand wanting to preserve the rights um, for the consumer, right? Um, what uh, I would say is, uh, is or recommend, while, okay, well, fine, if you, if you don't want to, in the pilot program, allow for that to happen, can, and can they still do uh, MSAs with long-term support issues, but reserve on it or make modifiable support orders. Let them set it to zero, let them reserve it. Um, make them, uh, just make it so that they can assist with MSAs that have modifiable support. Because what happens is, right, the whole premise of this was to open up, uh, uh, you know, affordable uh, legal services to different, uh, to the public, right? And so, I mean, there's a whole swath of the public that you're cut, Oops, that is getting cut out and who would no longer be, would have, could only go to an attorney to really terminate long-term spousal support or to an LDA, which we presently do that all the time. Um, and, you know, uh, and of course parties do it themselves. They terminate that themselves. And so, uh, and one thing is under, to un we need to understand, this is not our decision, whether the party wants to terminate or, you know, as an LDA or as any kind of professional, as even as an attorney, it's not uh, the attorney's decision whether the client will terminate. They can recommend. It ultimately comes down to the client. So putting hand, the power back in the hands of the client. So you know, um, if 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 you're going to proceed with prohibiting the termination of long-term support, then uh, still let them work on 
cases with long-term support issues, but make them, let them do it, that they're modifiable. And of course that would have to be part of the disclosure to the consumer. So they know, hey, yeah, you're gonna come here, but I can't help you deal with that uh, issue, right? I can only help you reserve, set it at zero, or uh, and it has to be modifiable. So it could potentially come back as an issue later down the way. So when you're negotiating and giving uh, whatever spouse the house, keep that in mind that they can also come back for support later when you negotiated that. So thank you, everyone. That's thank all. you. I do not see any other um, attendees who wish to speak at this point. So um, Leah, can you start us off on family? Yes, and I think it's actually Fariba who's gonna take us through this. All right, thank you so much. Uh, so first and foremost, I wanna start by thanking uh, the members of the subcommittee for all the hard work we've done to get here. I wanna thank the bar staff uh, for their invaluable contribution to what we do. Um, uh, this is, we've been on the agenda several times and the memo has been circulated several times. And so I hope that everybody has had a chance um, to review the memo, review the resolutions, have questions. Um, the memo you may have noticed is simpler because now we're concentrating on issues that we want to exclude rather than issues that we want to include, which is basically uh, the former being a shorter list. Um, we have several resolutions and um, as to the particular areas of law and some we have alternate resolutions as well. And I, uh, I'm going to present them in that way. I do want to start um, the discussion uh, with this. Um, when this is a post fee cap meeting, the decision made not to uh, impose fee caps. When we considered in court representation, um, we hadn't decided on fee caps. I have a real concern about authorizing paraprofessionals to pretty much in every area in family law to act as an attorney. Their license basically is not limited, uh, but for a few areas. In a child support hearing, on one side, a paraprofessional and a client, and on the other side, an attorney and a client, there is no difference, okay? And not that there are no fee caps, they don't have to keep their fees low. So I'm assuming we're gonna train them to litigate, okay? So now we're just calling him paraprofessional, but we have to train him as an attorney. So that access to justice goal of this whole effort, in my opinion, is out the window because now the client cannot afford a paraprofessional either because they're pretty much gonna charge the same way because we are imposing onerous credential, uh, credential requirements, right? So they have to pay for that and they have to pass on the cost to their client. We've got to have a palpable difference between the two professions, a lawyer and a paraprofessional. Family law is going to be the area that is going to be most utilized by the uh, segment of the uh, litigants we want to serve here, okay? if our stats here in my office and the self-help centers are any indication. And I want us to reconsider, a, at least in the area of family, which is what I'm here to discuss, is to not allow full representation out for any area in family law. And I'm gonna actually make a motion. I checked to make sure uh, I'm not a right of point of order here that I can actually make a motion that is not on the, in the memo and on the agenda. Just because we are in a different place than we were when we, the group, I believe, the group voted on an all-encompassing in-court representation to allow that. And I want us to consider, um, I'm gonna actually make a motion that we limit in-court representation for all areas covered by this subcommittee to allowing paraprofessionals to sit at the council table to support and advise their client and to answer procedural, direct procedural questions from the judge. So Fariba, I'm gonna ask you to, to hold on one second here because I'm a, I'm a little per, I'm a little confused um, to be blunt because I wasn't, um, and I have not attended every family law meeting. So I don't know if there was some discussion that I missed. 
but I'm a little perplexed as to what we're doing because uh, I had reviewed the memorandum and was expecting to have a discussion in regards to what the family law committee was putting forward. So I don't know whether you had a discussion within your committee of, of handling things differently today or whether you're trying to make your own motion. I'm just- um, I'm well, making my own motion and I understand that I can, but if I'm wrong, happy to- Oh, I, I'm not saying you can't make a motion. I'm just trying to understand procedurally what we're doing because I had it in my head that we were starting with family, going through what had been put forward in the memorandum, taking some votes and then moving to housing. So what was your um, expectation of how, as chair of that committee, as opposed to in your individual capacity, how we were going to be approaching family law today? I was, um, after asking whether I could introduce a new motion, uh, I wanted to start here because if this work group has reconsidered its position with regards to full in court representation, but I'm limiting to the to this subcommittee, then we really don't need to discuss full in court representation as to each resolution. And to, so that I understand, it is not, this is not a motion being requested by the full subcommittee, is that correct? It isn't because we had our last meeting and I have been considering and thinking and it's been really bothering me. So I wanted, so, we can't meet again, we couldn't meet again. So I'm putting it forward as my motion. Okay, and so you're making the motion in regards to representation by a family law paraprofessional as a whole in regards to any family law matter, as opposed to um, considering that in regards to a particular type of representation within family. And Judge Yu, I see your hand. Could I please make a motion to table Ms. Sarusha's motion until we actually kind of have a more fulsome discussion of what the committee did and their general recommendations? Because I think for me, that'll fit in better. I have read the memo. I thought it was very well done, really succinct. And, but I, I'm kind of like shaken if we go right to that motion before we get to hear from the committee and hear about its work. So I move to table that motion. I have no problem with, um, it hasn't been seconded. So uh, I have no problem when, uh, if we change when I present it, I just wasn't sure uh, whether I, I, I could present at the beginning, at the end. So I just um, talked to myself and decided we voted that I'm gonna just put it out there. And if we wanna table it to the end, that's fine. But the thing is under, if you notice under each topic, in our subcommittee, there is there are two resolutions. One is for the substantive area of law, and the second one is about full in court uh, or in court representation as to that substantive area of law. That's fine. I have to agree with Judge Yu that I think it would be helpful for the working group to um, have in their mind what exactly the proposals are regarding what the paraprofessionals would be doing. Um, and then maybe at some point, if you want to revive uh, the motion and see if you have a second. But unless there is someone else, and please feel free to raise your hand either um, in real life or virtually on Zoom. Is there someone else who wishes to be heard on this or are we okay jumping more substantively into the family law recommendations? You meant heard right now as opposed to heard later when we- Correct. Yes. And hi, Carolyn. So uh, Linda, if you could please just put in the minutes, Carolyn's joined us. Okay, so no other comments, just making sure under, again, I'm just gonna repeat, under each topic, we have a resolution for the substantive area and then a resolution regarding in-court representation. So if my motion is tabled to the end, does that mean we don't take a vote on the second part? Yes. Thank you. I think for me, it would be helpful to just kind of hear fr from the committee as a whole first, as opposed to one person who, you know, is making her own motion, as opposed to like the committee's presentation, unless you feel that the memo spoke for itself and we should just kind of delve in. No, I'm, I'm, I'm making a motion, asking for a second, I'm going to open it up to, for a discussion. I thought that was the way these things work, right? Make motions, if it's second, then it's opened up for discussion. Happy to table it. Uh, uh, but I think I, for me, when I read the memo, there were resolutions already there. So I, I thought we'd be going through. And when we got to your point, 
we would discuss it, but I'm, I'm thinking maybe you're- Could everyone who's not speaking, please mute themselves. I'm getting some weird feedback. I'm thinking maybe the thought is that we've already read the memos and we should just launch right in. Well, for the, I have a couple of the ink hold on for Ava. Sorry, yes. hold on because I have more hands. Um, Julia? I'm just answering your juice question, but it's no problem. Julia? I second the motion to table. I second the motion to table your motion till the end of the group presentation. I would like to hear the full report before the resolutions. And after before we actually vote on the resolutions, I would like to then hear your motion. So we can take it at that time. But I feel like I'm I'm not well advised as to what we're considering here today before we jump to your motion. Thank you, Julia. And Carolyn? Okay. Um, I am willing to second the motion, but I agree we should talk about it more. Uh, second uh, my motion, but you want to talk about it more. Thank uh, right. Second, second your motion for Eva. Thank you. Any other? Okay. I don't mind tabling it. I'm still confused to until when, but that's no problem. We can go forward in the interest of time. So the, could you, um, Linda, could I ask you to put the first uh, resolution out, up, please? So, oops, camera. Okay. So again, I have to ask, my plan was to put the resolution up. Uh, the group has a consensus for this particular resolution as to the substantive areas of law we want, uh, well, except for one issue and uh, Mr. Hamilton will talk about that. So what I was gonna do is was to make the motion, have it seconded and in the discussion, ask Mr. Hamilton to talk about his position regarding long-term support and ask for other discussion after that, and then we will take a vote. Is that um, satisfactory? Because now I'm a little bit <laughs> weary about doing what I wanted to do. Yes, okay, good. No opposition? Okay, great. Um, all right, so this is our first resolution. Um, I'm gonna let everyone read it. Again, this is these are the areas that will be excluded Um, Mr. Fleshman? Yes? Reba? Yes. By omission, I understand under discovery, this includes paraprofessionals will be able to include third party subpoenas. Is that correct? Steve Hamilton? Yes. All right, so my question for the judges is, are the judges comfortable with that? My understanding is the subpoena is a court order and out of necessity, we allow attorneys to sign them, but it's really a judicial function that gets delegated. Are the judges on the committee comfortable delegating that to a paraprofessional? If they are, I'm fine with that. Uh, Claudia, I'll get you in a moment. Let me see if judges have a uh, response to that question from Steve. Uh, yes, this is Judge Wiley. I, I'm comfortable with that. I, I view that uh, largely as a ministerial function. If there's a motion to quash a subpoena or the subpoena is um, defective in any way, then that uh, there's a process uh, to deal with that. Okay. Any other judges? I know we don't have a lot. Uh, judge, you? I, I wasn't going to speak to that, um, but I had a question because it looked like there was an alternate resolution and I wasn't sure if there was a recommendation from the committee or if there was why there's an alternate and what, what the recommendation would be. Uh, I was gonna ask Steve to speak to that if the motion is seconded and then we have a discussion. I, I, I feel like that's the way things go, right? I make the motion uh, as is um, stated here I get a second, then we pause for discussion, and when that's when all the questions come in. But what's the motion? Is the motion this is resolved from for Reba? 
Well, yes. Is the motion going to include the alternate or the motion not going to include the alternate? So uh, that's no, no, it's not going to include. I'm sorry, I wasn't clear. It's not going to include the alternate. So I can read it. No, but then I don't really know if I'm going to vote for it or not. That's why I need to know what the motion is and why I'm asking, should the alternate be included or not? Right. So, so, we'll have I think a the motion is going to be made seconded and then there'll be discussion and then there may be a friendly amendment. Is okay. Would, Julia and Claudia, are your questions, can your questions wait until the discussion portion here? Well, mine was just simply over the way you put discovery, it says depositions, but so now, I mean, technically you can have a deposition subpoena for a third party. Are, are you trying to intend that this is only oral depositions? Okay, so I, I think that's a discussion question, if you don't mind. Let's get the motion in, let's second it, and we'll discuss it, we won't vote on it. So hold on, hold on one second, because I just would like to know, I believe Judge Harper has joined us. Um, and there was a question that was put out to the judges in regards to subpoenas. And so if you would like to chime in, um, he certainly may. I just have a question. Judge Harper, are you there? Because the, huh. Oh, he says he's only able to observe. Linda, can you see if he's in the participants um, in the correct group, please? Yeah, he is in the attendees and we need him moved over to panelist. Did you want to call on Claudia? Yes, but Claudia, while we're trying to get that done. Thanks everybody. Um, I just would like, could somebody explain to me what are nullity matters? I looked up the meaning of the word nullity and it says an actor thing that is legally void, but I don't understand. So nullities are, sure, nullities are to address marriages that are void or voidable. Void marriages are marriages where the parties are in a closer relationship that authorize incestuous relationships. Okay, um, like an annulment, you mean nullity? Yes, it's, it's um, yeah, in, in family law, uh, the term is nullity. And I believe from the religious standpoint in like a Catholic church annulment, that's the only difference. And avoidable are, are grounds that have to be proven such as fraud, force, mental incapacity, things like that. And, and Claudia, let me just say that although I sat in family law 10 years ago, I also read this and thought nullity matters. What is that? It's so possible. we're in the same boat. <laughs> yes, true. Um, so I apparently was just never using the term or not using it properly. So now we have uh, Judge Harper in with the panelists. Judge Harper, any thoughts on whether you'd have an issue with um, paraprofessionals being um, allowed to get subpoenas out within the areas that they can, as opposed to attorneys? No, I, I agree with Judge Wiley. I heard her comments and I agree with her. I, I don't think that's an issue for, for me and family law matters at all. Uh, Claudia, do you have a new question or that was the previous? Okay, okay, good, good, good. All right, um, so at this point, I'm gonna um, ask that the, uh, uh, make a motion that the um, work group adopt as resolved. Uh, oh, Steve? I, I can speak after the, the motion in a second. And, and it really doesn't matter, but just to be clear, there, it's not that we need to have a motion in order to be able to discuss a matter. We can certainly discuss things um, prior to a motion being made. Um, so uh, Stephen Hamilton, is there something, would you like to speak now or hold? Um, I think it might help. So responding to Stephen Fleischman's question, the, the, the paraprofessionals have to be able to issue subpoenas to so take them to be able to get records. Most of those are going to be accompanied by a notice to consumer so that the opposing party knows that their records are going to be sought. Those are subpoenas. My function is right now as an attorney is telling my paralegal what I want and her going to the attorney service. And basically they generate 95% of the work at this point anyway. So that function is already being done by non-attorneys. It just has to be my signature on the subpoena. Um, so it's not really a a significant expansion beyond the services already being provided by non-lawyers. It's just the signature issue. 
with regards to the language uh, under bullet point discovery depositions, I think that that should be modified to say depositions excluding uh, subpoenas deuces take up. Thank you. Uh, Linda, could we make that change? I'm sorry, can you clarify again? I would take out the... Steve? Yeah, so put a comma after the word depositions, excluding subpoenas, deuces, D-U-C-E-S, take them, T-E-C. The, int the intent is for those subpoenas to be um, authorized? Yes, technically the form itself says deposition subpoena, but those are where the deponent does not show up. They're not asked questions. They produce records and a custodian of records declaration. It's all paperwork, no live appearances or interaction. Okay. I just wonder because this is a resolution that lists things that are excluded and then we say comma excluding if we should just put in parens after the um, subpoenas deuces tech, um, which will be authorized or something I don't know because it's many negatives here. Can I ask for a point of clarification Stephen? So is your intention just to say they cannot take oral depositions? Yes, that's probably cleaner. So then let's just say oral depositions instead of excluding, excluding. I like that idea because then we'll just stay true to the uh, memo uh, listing things that are ex excluded. So I have Amos and then I have Brady. Thank you. So I did have a general question going back to just the approach because this is very different framing than the subcommittee had before where it was listing the matters that were included and now we are we've changed to listing matters that are excluded obviously conceptually either could work but i am interested to hear from the family law subject matter specialists or experts uh, of what the breadth of this really is because when there's specific tasks that are listed it's easy to to go down the checklist and understand but for those of us who are not family law specialists I'm wondering how broad this really is and if it will if it will be clear what paraprofessionals can and can't do. Uh, just uh, as a member of the subcommittee and chair, I, it was just um, there's so many issues that uh, they can handle uh, that it seems simpler to just say what they are not authorized to handle. And yes, I get your point that is for those of um, you and, and frankly the public, um, uh, it's easier to go down the list and see what they can handle. Um, but again, it would be, and you have the memo attached, by the way, the original memo is just such a long list. Uh, any other members of the subcommittee, do you have anything to add here in answer to Amos's question? And I have Brady and Caroline, just hang on. Members of the subcommittee, Judge Wiley? I agree. It, if you want to think about it um, qualitatively or quantitatively, I guess it's probably 90% of what is possible um, is contained uh, within things that they will be able to do. Um, it's a very finite amount, uh, particularly in family law, um, where you don't often see discovery at all uh, of things that they will not be able to do. Okay, thank you. So can I ask one more clarifying question then? It, would it be appropriate just in the introduction here when it's to provide representation in all family law matters. Is there some limitation? Is this like pending, pending certain types of divorces, child custody matters? Is there some kind of, because it just seems like all family law matters. That's not with respect to certain pending. For me, that's very, very broad and I'm just not sure what it includes. Of course, I defer to the subject matter specialists. This is Elizabeth. Um, 
uh, for you, but what, I mean, would we maybe put in the resolution that reference attachment A to this memo, would that help? Because what we've done is we've listed out every task possible that family law could um, have. And we said included, included, included. I don't know if um, referencing the attachment is appropriate in something like this, but I think that would help show what we are allowing paraprofessionals to do. If, if, can I actually interject something? Linda? I think part of uh, what came up and this was, some of this came from, from the meetings with some of the other subcommittees. There was a concern that if we delineate what is allowed and what's not allowed, if somehow there was a task that was omitted, just there was an oversight and we missed something, then it wouldn't be clear. Um, whether someone could or couldn't do it. And so the idea of everything is allowed unless it's specifically excluded seemed to be a more straightforward approach. I think that was part of why we moved to this uh, method, methodology. In other words, if we by accident miss something that you're uh, authorized to do it, right? Because it's not on the list of unauthorized activities. Yeah. Okay. But I think Elizabeth's reference to that um, attachment would give Amos just the general sense of what's contemplated, what's the universe, because that is the universe that the subcommittee identified. Um, but I also agree from a regulatory perspective, focusing on what's not allowed um, is going to be a much more effective way to regulate. I know I have other questions. Uh, Brady, Caroline, Julia, is that a new hand or the old one? It is. Oh, it is not the X. Hang on. Uh, but any other members of the subcommittee want to comment on Amos's question before we move on? Yeah, I, I'm not sure at this point. Um, uh, I want to consider it a little more, Amos. So if you don't mind, so let, let's think think on that. Um, all right, Bray, uh, I believe Brady is next. Sure, I'm just thinking ahead to needing to operationalize this in a, in a proposed rule. Um, on oral, on the dep exclusion for oral depositions, is that taking them or, or would they still be allowed to Different. prepare the notice and let somebody else do it, let the uh, client do it? Okay, I'm gonna defer to my litigator, Stephen <laughs> Hamilton. Uh, you're on mute. Can you repeat the question, Brady? Does the exclusion for oral depositions um, include the, just preparing and serving the notice um, or, or would that be okay as long as, as the paraprofessional is not taking the deposition? I think as worded, it would exclude preparing the notice of deposition. Basically that everything related to oral depositions. Correct. Okay. Um, would that, would that uh, not, uh, makes I, I don't know that that makes a lot of sense uh, to me that they would not be allowed to prepare a deposition notice uh, and you know have the deposition notice uh, sent to the uh, deponent. I agree that taking the deposition uh, should be excluded. Defending, I would imagine, a deposition which we did really not discuss specifically would be excluded. But I think um, preparing the notice seems to me again to be a, a fairly ministerial task uh, that should be allowed. And so that I'm clear, my response was based on not a not a policy position, just what was included as worded. If that is the inclination of everybody, we could change it to conducting oral depositions. Um, can I speak to that, Stephen? Conducting yeah. and defending, I guess. Julia? I, I think I would leave it at oral depositions because this is my problem. Why would a paraprofessional get to notice a deposition, say they want a production of documents, and say they do that wrong? Then the attorney who is stuck taking this deposition is stuck with a poorly drafted notice of deposition and request for production of documents just because this person thought they knew everything under the sun that that attorney needed. And so I can't imagine being an attorney who has not had involvement in setting the deposition, but yet I'm going to be on the hook for what happens in that room. Okay. 
Um, let me have Stephen respond. And then Carolyn, I know you're waiting. Thank you so much for your patience. Yeah, I'm, I'm aligned with Julie on that position. Just for anecdotal purposes, very rarely are depositions taken in uh, family law cases. I would say it's less than 10% of the cases. And those 10% of the cases, almost always, it is cases that are involving uh, high net worth individuals and significant assets. You're getting documents, you're taking the deposition of an accountant, that type of thing. It's not happening and it, my 90% may be low. Um, and I think that the person that notices the deposition needs the accountability of also taking the deposition to parallel what Julia said. I would say the one exception that comes up is it may be more frequent in domestic violence cases to attempt to take depositions, but there is an ongoing debate and it's unresolved whether you can stop the deposition based on Marcy's law. I've heard and seen the argument that that uh, would somehow preclude a deposition being taken prior to a domestic violence restraining order hearing. And I don't think that there's an answer or consensus on that issue. I think all of these either involve complex financial issues or issues where because of the sensitivities involved before a victim of domestic violence is subject to a deposition, there should be an attorney accountable for trying to uh, create that process. Okay, uh, Carolyn, thank you. Okay, so okay, so in this conversation alone, I have heard and, and just query, you know, we take the bar exam as lawyers, okay, in California, maybe not some other states, we used to have to do, you know, these written things, and um, you'd sit down and have an essay, they'd pick a topic, you'd have to select, um, you'd do issue spotting. And, and to do that sort of thing, community property was always a big bugaboo for kids who are coming from out of state, or young persons or candidates coming from out of state, because you never learned California community property in your law school. California community property, Marvin versus Marvin, is really complicated. And I'm going to confess here that as an early lawyer, well, not as an early lawyer, but when I started out on my own a couple of years ago, I actually helped out two friends in their divorce cases. And, and I did it for nothing. And we took depositions. And when I took over the one for a friend of mine, she'd done some pro se depositions uh, where the other side was represented. She, she did get it was terrible. She didn't even order a transcript. We had to go back and, and figure out what was said. But in this conversation, thinking about issue spotting and what lawyers, paraprofessionals, all are going to have to understand based on just what we talked about. I heard issues of real property, community property. These are courses in law school, full three credit courses, some a year long. Real property, community property, evidence, wills and trusts, contract law, business law, um, housing law, and when Steve just brought up criminal law, and I had in one of those cases a TRO because there was domestic violence uh, that was interrelated, and I've done a bunch of those uh, domestic violence TROs, again, pro bono for people, and I know how complex they are. Every time I do one, I swear I'll never do it again because <laughs> it's really emotional and hard and, and traumatic, and we have the trauma counseling that's in our thing, but we're setting up here a, a baby bar. You know, we're setting, this is, when I saw this recommendation, and I'll, I'll be quiet because I'm not speaking to the resolution that's in front. I, I was stunned. I was just blown away at what it says. You know, we just had a question, what's a nullity? I had no idea what a nullity was. How many people here actually understand what these terms are? And thank you from the family committee for doing all this work. But we're a, community, we're a big group. We're supposed to oppose this or, or vote it up or down. There was a really simple answer to all of this. Standing at the, at the council table helping people it was one thing. And we decided as a group to say, oh no, oh no, in court. And now we're stuck here, exception after exception, a deposition, a subpoena, an interrogatory. I don't know how many hundreds of times I've had to explain to my clients what a deposition is, what it is. So subpoena dues to some, forget it. I don't know what we're doing. I, I honestly looked at that resolution and those recommendations just blew my mind. So I, I'm for these exclusions, but I just gotta tell you, if you don't take one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight times three, 24 credits of law school, you'll never be able to do this. You'd be a JD with a family law bar, a bar number. That's all we're doing here. It's not gonna be any cheaper than a lawyer. I have to say, that's why I um, started the way I did because I'm just really concerned that we're setting up these 
people from failure because there's no way we're going to cover everything they need to know with the program with device. So uh, thank you, Carolyn, for your comment. Julia, is that a new hand or the old one? <laughs> Get down. That's a new hand. Oh, <laughs> thank you for all your participation. Go ahead. So coming from a standpoint of an educator, if they cannot develop the coursework that makes a paraprofessional proficient in doing this, then they're not going to pass the exam. Then we've asked too much. So I think to say that this human being is not going to be competent enough to do these things, that is what is going to be the, the objective of the educators is to make sure this curriculum is you know, robust enough to where it meets these different student learning outcomes. If we cannot achieve that, that will occur during the curriculum development process. But to say that it, I mean, we have to remember that the majority of the people I think that we are considering are already paralegals and if they like family law, then they've taken family law as a paralegal student. If they're JDs, then they have probably taken family law in law school. So we have to remember that we're getting candidates that are coming with some background in the law. These are not, you know, clean slates. These are people who have, we, we, we specifically made it rigorous enough to be qualified to begin this program by having a background in the law. And it's usually going to be as a paralegal you graduated or as a lawyer, as a JD you graduated law school. So let's just remember we have some very proficient people that we hope will be entering this program. Thank you, Julie. I'm also hoping that we're considering future generations of uh, paraprofessionals that are coming up now. Uh, Judge, you, you have your hand up. I just wanted to reiterate what Julia said because that's what I was thinking and what I was gonna say. And I'm so glad that Julia is reminding us of that. Thank you. Leah? Well, I'm just wondering, so we have um, the motion on the screen, the alternate that I think Stephen Hamilton is uh, proposing would strike one of the bullets if I understand it. So maybe we could have Stephen speak to that and then see if we can get a second either for your motion for Eva or a first and a second for the alternate motion that Stephen is recommending. Sure, actually I think it would add a bullet because he's asking that long-term spousal support be excluded. Oh, sorry, okay, yeah. yeah. Okay, um, I, you know, listen, I'll go with whatever I'm told to do, really honestly, <laughs> these are confusing. Uh, so I don't know, we can ask Steve to talk about his uh, point of view and then uh, we could talk about amending the motion or I can ask for a second. Honestly, I just, I'm looking for some guidance here. I would like to hear from Steve Hamilton, Stephen. Okay. Sure. So it's not, exactly worded the way that would to address the issue that I wanted to address. What I do not want, whether it's um, as part of a marital settlement agreement that there is a termination of spousal support jurisdiction in a long-term marriage. That is a marriage uh, of 10 years or longer. The court typically reserves jurisdiction over those cases. Um, the other thing I would not want is a non-modifiable spousal support order. Sometimes those are included as part of the division of assets and debts and calculating what that is or whether spousal support should be bought out really involves higher end calculations that I wasn't probably doing during my first five years of practice because it requires you to kind of project what future permanent spousal support would be it requires you to figure out what the actuarial value is of that or the current present value of that is. It requires you to factor in considerations such as remarriage, health of the parties. So what I wanted to exclude um, from the spousal support in a marital settlement agreement was unless included a marital settlement agreement that does not terminate or set non-modifiable spousal support. 
Okay. And just for clarification, Steve, for those of uh, group members who don't practice family laws, there's no uh, standard formula for long-term spousal support, only for temporary spousal support. Some counties have uh, guideline formulas, kind of like child support, but for long-term, there's no formula. So that's why it's so complicated because attorneys have to actually do things by hand and, and look at various factors to determine the correct amount. Um, yeah, there's, four, there's 14 different sub factors within Family Code Section 4320, and many of those include sub uh, additional calculations, and they cover everything from marital standard of living, earnings capacity, the degree to which the supported spouse contributed to the uh, career position or education of the supporting spouse, mm -hmm. whether there was any periods of unemployment due to um, uh, uh, household responsibilities or childcare responsibilities, health of the parties, it, it's extensive. And the last factor is the catch-all factor. So, right. <laughs> never right. ending. Which, you know, I, and I just have to jump in to say, because I've been thinking about what everyone's saying, and I just want to bring us back for a moment to the reality of family law, which is that the vast, vast majority of people currently have no representation whatsoever. Uh, and I don't want us to lose sight of that. I, can, of course, completely agree that people have to be ready, willing, and able to handle these issues competently, professionally, well, all the rest of it. But I don't want us to lose sight of where we're sitting right now, which is that uh, the vast majority of people, I can't even remember what the numbers are. I think, what is it in San Francisco, Judge Wiley, you know, don't have any assistance with any of this. It's, it's I think it's probably an, ex, an ex, excess of 60 to 70% roughly. Same, same in Cal, uh, same in South Carolina, and I think that's statewide as well. Consistent. I, I agree with that, and, I, and and so the alternative is being in proper and representing yourself versus having someone competently help you. But I also think we have to look at the fact that most of those rough representative litigants do not have long-term spousal support issues. Really, mostly we're looking at. Uh, that was not my experience at all uh, when I was in family. I mean, I can, Judge Wiley can speak to it or Judge Harper if he's done family, but I had plenty of self-represented on both sides, long-term marriages. And it could be county by county. My experience is different. Our, our DV dedicated calendars, 97% self-represented on a divorce, dissolution matters, more like 70 or 65%. Um, I have Steve Fleischman next and then Elizabeth and then Leah. Steve, I'm not a family law lawyer, but if I understand your proposal, <clears throat> we're talking about negotiating a marital settlement agreement. And if the paraprofessional is in the case trying to negotiate a marital settlement agreement, and then the other side is insisting on one of these terms, is that going to give one side the ability to disqualify the paraprofessional or... Just, just tell me how this is going to work in uh, real life if you have an attorney on one side and a paraprofessional on the other. It, it would not, because in a long-term marriage at the trial level, the court is not going to issue a terminating order. The trial court's not going to issue a non-modifiable order. They may issue something called a Richmond order, which is where there are periodic step-downs, typically not up, up increases, but step-downs in the spousal support but even those are subject to be modified down the road um, based on the circumstances. So this is really, this is something that's negotiated in cases. For example, I may have a case where we're trading spousal support to the supported party for the supported party keeping their pension, but it's not something that's within the court's authority to order at the, at the initial trial time in a long-term marriage. All right. And let me, yeah, let me add one it. caveat. I guess technically, and I'll defer to the to Justice Petru and the, the judicial officers, the one exception might be if you have a finding of domestic violence and particularly a criminal conviction for it, they may be able to, to terminate spousal support at the time of trial, even a long-term marriage, as to the abuser's right to get spousal support. But generally speaking, this is something that's negotiated, it's voluntary, it can't be compelled. So a represented party couldn't force a, a paraprofessional out of the agreement if they were trying to say, well, I want a terminating order, they can't get it. It has to be agreed to by the supportive party. 
Okay. All right. Um, All right. Thank you. Elizabeth? Um, so um, I don't agree with that term that's highlighted on the screen that we're looking at now, where we're saying that um, it doesn't, as long as it doesn't uh, terminate it completely, or, um, and we've had multiple discussions about it. I just wanted to um, reiterate, just like what the public commenter said, Angela Grijalva, um, who's an LDA. Again, um, this resolution is proposing to terminate the paraprofessional's ability to advocate for the self-represented well spouse to terminate long in a long-term um, marriage. However, um, LDAs are doing it already. And um, the premise of this whole paraprofessional program is to give legal counsel to people who otherwise would not have any. And I mentioned in a different meeting, a subcommittee family meeting is that if you, if the paraprofessional has to get out of the case once long-term support needs to be negotiated, um, you're essentially sending a self-represented individual with no assistance at all. I believe that with proper training, paraprofessionals can do this um, in long-term marriages um, because of the family code factors and 4320 essentially are straightforward, right? You're talking about marketable skills, earning capacity, um, and you know, excluding tax consequences. Um, but pretty much this can be a taught issue. Um, the, the MSAs are to keep these cases out of court. And so um, people are doing it already. An example, I'm an LDA. Um, people come to me and they say, we do not, we want to waive our right for spousal support. And so as document preparers, we have to put those terms in the agreement as they request it. And we don't have any say on what they choose. Um, people do it for strategic reasons. We just make sure that we're using the language that has appropriate waivers and stipulations. And it, you know, the wording is clear. It says, you know, by you signing off on this today, you are um, know that this situation can change in the future. Also, the demographic that we're looking to assist is um, they don't have much money to fight over. There's not, there's, by them waiving their spousal support rights, it's not like they're walking away from a lot of money. There is no, the, there is no money to negotiate. Um, let me see. Um, the Judicial Council came out with a form that helps people to make these decisions. Um, in, in addition, Family Court Services in San Francisco, if you go to the Family Court Access Center, what they call it here, the they give a sample MSA agreement that you just check up a box and it says, yes, we waive our long-term support. So it's something that's um, being done even at the courthouse. And at the end of the day, it's, you know, like the commenter said earlier, it's the uh, person's personal decision um, it's not up to the attorney or the paraprofessional to, um, you know, check off that box for them. It's just to give them the counsel. And that's what we, what this would do. So I don't like that we're trying to limit it to um, in this way where we can't allow to assist persons who want to get out of a relationship and terminate their spousal support so that they can move on with their life um, and I, I think it's too limiting and I think it should be allowed. So Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, I'm going to let Steve respond. And I know, Kimberly, you have your hand up, Leah. You don't have a question anymore because your hand was up. No. Okay. No. Okay. Uh, and then judge you after that. Okay. What I, wor what I worry about is the non low income cases where they've elected to use paraprofessionals. We've got a long term marriage, we've got middle incomes where there could be negotiation and where the party needs the benefit of counsel of an attorney, not a paraprofessional, to address any attempts to set non-modifiable support or to terminate it. Because in those situations, I would have a significant concern. I, I think though, after listening to some of Elizabeth's initial comments, I don't have a problem with 
the paraprofessionals dealing with long-term spousal support at a hearing in front of a judicial officer. I think my biggest concern is when it's in a marital settlement agreement, the termination or non inclusion of non-modifiable spousal support. So that would expand the scope of the services that can be performed. They could do a reserved order, a zero dollar order without terminating one of the party's rights or both of the party's rights to get spousal support in a marital settlement agreement. And that wouldn't run afoul of the narrow restriction that I'm, I'm suggesting. It would allow them to assist in long-term spousal support issues that are being heard by a judicial officer who can intervene if they think something's not being presented or addressed, if that makes sense. So in other words, I'm saying to, to make the restriction narrow than it's indicated, but to have it maybe say, specifically state term termination or issuance of non-modifiable spousal support orders in long-term marriages. And I have to say, Steve, um, in, when the parties are stipulating, I'm assuming we are training these paraprofessionals on being trauma-informed and being able to tell signs of coercion, uh, coercion and pressure when parties are negotiating an agreement. Um, so I, I actually have the opposite concern, which is representation in court on these issues. Um, I, I know Kimberly, you're next, and the juice hand is down. So Kimberly, thank you, Prula. Um, I just have a question based on what Elizabeth said, and actually something that Amos brought up earlier, more of a large maybe policy um, question, and that is that. First of all, I don't know the, the complete um, scope of what LDAs can do, but when we're looking at this, that is something I think at a higher level when we go back and look at what all the paraprofessional can do that they should be able to do um, the scope of service there. So I don't think we should limit them from anything that LDAs are currently doing if that is the case. And then the second piece to Am Amos's earlier point is, is there um, somewhere where there is written out like family law, what is covered under family law or what that scope is to where it's very clear um, and defined. And maybe that's something that it just is in the, the legal world. Everybody knows that this specific thing is family law. It's just for me not being an attorney, I wouldn't know, but I just wanna make sure that that is clear somewhere for individuals to understand that scope. Those, those are my two points, maybe larger policy questions. Okay, thank you, Joju. Your hand is back up. Thank you, Fariba. Um, I guess I was going to initially ask Elizabeth what language she thought would be useful or if she just wanted that provision out. And then it sounded like Steve was thinking that there would be modified language he could be living with. So I thought he was going to propose it, but I'm, I'm not sure if that's coming. And I'm wondering if Elizabeth or Steve have some language that would encompass Steve sort of uh, saying that he could, you know, he thinks that there's a little bit more room to add more that a paraprofessional could do in that, that particular area. I would propose that we remove that um, highlighted section altogether, and I would be happy with that. That's, again, just my, my perspective. Steve? I, I don't agree to that. I, I think that the, anything that terminates spousal support in a long-term marriage or makes the spousal support non-modifiable is going to raise significant consumer protection issues when a party is getting advice from a paraprofessional versus an attorney. Okay. And I will tell you, I don't think that there are many offices where an, a, a family law associate with less than five years experience is negotiating terminating or non-modifiable orders. This isn't mm -hmm. something that's being handled by attorneys first year out of law school. I think you were saying that for high marital estates, that that's going to be a real issue, but that there might be some place where it would be all right for paraprofessionals to work on. And I, I've only done long-term um, family trials. Um, so the long cause, like $32 million marital estate. So I, I don't really understand all the other things about family, but I'm wondering if Judge Wiley or Judge Harper 
would be able to help us find some language that would uh, capture what Elizabeth is concerned about and what Steve is concerned about. I, I think the difficulty from my perspective is that I, I agree that establishing the 4320 factors, you know, it, it's, it's listed uh, very clearly in the family code and following those factors and developing the evidence. I don't think that that is outside of what a paraprofessional can do. I think that that's entirely within, um, if you will, their wheelhouse uh, with the appropriate education. Um, I do agree with um, Mr. Hamilton that it, it is slightly different if you're going to completely terminate or, or have non-modifiable support um, because that's gonna have a significant repercussion on a, a potential client. Um, and so I, I think that needs to be treated a little bit differently uh, in the first instance. So I'll think about, I see uh, Judge Harper has something to say, so I'll think about perhaps um, something that we can use as a compromise. And before we move on to Judge Harper, I just wanna make sure I understand you, uh, Judge. Uh, are, and Steve, are we talking about term, uh, termination and non-modifiable spousal support in both long-term and short-term marriages? Because termination really has the same impact in a short-term marriage and a long-term marriage is if, it's, if a supported, proposed supported spouse wants spousal support in a short-term marriage and you know, it's terminated, you know, the, the concerns are the same, right? Well, I think you're going to have a temporary spousal support uh, that, that probably will have been issued. And so if it's a two-year marriage and you want long-term spousal support, you, you know, more than likely you're not going to get it. So I have, I have less concern in a short-term marriage than I do in a long-term marriage, because in a long-term marriage, typically you're going to have, you know, perhaps one spouse that, that was working, one spouse that wasn't working. And so there are, I think, again, a lot more significant long-term repercussions uh, with respect to those cases. And if a marriage is nine and a half years versus 10 years, you know, those concerns come up, right? Uh, Judge uh, Harper. I, I agree a lot with what Judge Wiley said. You know, I, I think, um, you know, in terms of, of percentages of, of family law uh, cases here that are unrepresented, it's a significant, it's, it's definitely 60, 70%. The family law cases that we do have that are represented, we have probably, probably three or four attorneys that really handle most of those. Um, but they definitely do not reach down into the low income um, family law issues. Uh, we do have a significant amount of cases where the parties, even on a long-term marriage, are, are stipulating to no spousal support. They have worked that out amongst themselves. Um, so this really highlights, I think, some of the issues we have, which is, is this an issue where we're taking work away from attorneys or is this an issue where we're helping low income um, people who need help? And, and so, you know, from my perspective up here, it really is not taking work away from attorneys, but it's really providing help for people who would re be representing themselves and at least giving some guidance in, in what to present to the court in order to resolve their, their family law matter. Um, but uh, in terms of this issue, it's really, it's not a, obviously not a simple issue here. It's, um, it almost needs language to cover both areas. And I don't know if we can just cover it in one sentence, but really divide it out. Judge Wiley, did you have a comment? Okay. Well, and, and, and that's a good point. Perhaps that's the answer is that you just simply divide it out um, separately um, instead of trying to encapsulate both thoughts in that one sentence. Yeah. Uh, how would you do that? Do you have any proposal? Judge Harper, that was your idea. <laughs> well, we can help out. Steve, yeah. do you have any proposal, proposed language based on what you have heard? And Elizabeth, one moment. Go ahead, Steve. I think of everything we discussed, I think the language that's currently on the screen is the language I'm the most comfortable with and, and addresses my primary concern, which is termination or non-modifiable spousal support orders in long-term marriages. Okay, Elizabeth. Um, oh, your hand is down, so. <laughs> I, just, I just wanted to um, respond to Hamilton regarding um, that the long-term support can be reserved for future determination so that there is no waiver. Um, just my experience has been that when people divorce, they, um, they don't really like to leave that option open um, because people want to move on with their life, get a new job and start making more money and they don't want to have that 
you might get hit with spousal support in the future um, looming. Um, so just wanted to respond to that, why we can't just allow people to reserve. Could one people choose not to? Um, okay. That would still be, an MSA could include a provision that reserves jurisdiction over spousal support in a long-term marriage. And that's consistent with the wording that's on the screen because a reservation doesn't terminate it and a reservation doesn't make it non-modifiable. So that's still within the wheelhouse or the toolbox for a paraprofessional. Yes, all I'm saying is it's not necessarily an option that the majority of um, the people choose. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's all, thank you. So I just wanna point out the time is 2.09. We still have several other resolutions and we'll have housing as well. So um, we, the way I look at it, there are two issues on the table here. One is the list, should it be items that are include, uh, uh, include and excluded together or just the um, issues that are excluded. And then the second one being the long-term spousal support. Judge you. I guess unless we can think of some other more um, precise language that would capture the discussion, it seems to me the language is necessary because the, you know, because of the discussion we've had and and there are carve outs that would allow the paraprofessional to do what they need to do if they put certain language in the MSA. So that being said, I'm not sure if you ever got a motion or a second, but if you need a motion, I'm moving that we adopt the language as it's reflected currently in this first resolution. Okay. Second. Do I have a second? Steve, did you second it? I did. Okay. So um, discussion, Amos? I would like to, um, following up on my earlier discussion and Kim's discussion, make a friendly amendment that um, in the first part of this resolution that we reference or identify what the tasks that have been listed in exhibit A to the memo, mm -hmm. so that it's clear what we're referring to. And it's not, I think it, I think it needs to be clear what a paraprofessional can and can't do. Okay. I I'm willing to accept that friendly amendment as long as exhibit A indicates it's not meant to be a fully comprehensive list so that we address the confusion concern that Linda had mentioned. And that's why and, and I want to I wanted to clarify that the 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 memo with today's date on it does not have an attachment A. So and in the previous memos the the memo from February had an attachment A, the memo from April had an attachment B and they were not the same. The, the first one didn't include everything. And I think um, even beyond that, the, the, la the last memo that came in April, I don't think it included everything that is included in the current memo. So that's the danger of referencing one of those. But I think, but I think with Judge Yu's language saying that this is um, merely like representative, it's not intended to be exhaustive, and you can reference whatever the right attachment is and right memo date. Mm -hmm. I, I think it it's okay that it's not. To me, and I agree with just one question: that what 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 if an item is excluded? Is that, are they authorized to handle it or are they not authorized to handle it? So my understanding is this is direction for whoever's gonna be drafting this to draft it, um, but this isn't the actual law that will be in place or the rules. So um, my, my concern is that at the end of the day, it needs to be clear what a paraprofessional can and can't do. Okay, I'm gonna, um, Iris hands up, Julia's hands up. No, but uh, is the friendly oh. amendment accepted by the second? Oh. It is, yeah, including but not limited to those tasks kind of language, agreed. Um, Ira and then Julia. Um, what Elizabeth said about uh, uh, a lot of people um, getting divorces uh, uh, don't want to uh, continue on with the risk of being ordered to uh, to uh, give support. Um, so I, I, 
I don't see what, why, maybe it's because I, I don't know enough. Um, I don't see why a uh, paraprofessional couldn't write up a document that says in big letters, you are giving up the right to support money from your spouse any time in the future. It's pretty darn clear. And uh, so I think that uh, they should be able to exclude uh, uh, spousal support. And uh, terminate, you mean? No, it wouldn't, it's not terminated. There isn't any. Um, so, so this the uh, the agreement or the decree would be, and no spousal support in any time in the future. Right, that's termination. That's termination. Yes. All right, okay. I didn't think that, that it's termination when there wasn't one to begin with, but all right. Okay, so you don't agree with that portion of the second highlighted portion, right, to be included? Yeah, I'd, okay. I'd like to hear people say why that's wrong. I, I know people talked about it already, but yes, I, I disagree with it right now. Okay, thank you. Julia. Um, I, this was just from a drafting perspective. Um, when I think of looking at this, I think of the paralegal statutes found in Business and Profession Code 6450 through 6456, and they generally set forth what type of work is considered substantial legal work to give a paralegal an idea. And they do go through listing quite a few things not necessarily discrete tasks, but areas of their ability to work, but it's always under the supervision of an attorney. But I will say, there's then a section following that saying they cannot do this. And I think it's really important to have what they cannot do in our resolution. Later on, perhaps if if they can find, you know, a, in a, a, a list, if it is that attached to be, I'm fine with that. But in terms of my resolution to know what I'm saying, I do not want them to be doing this. To me, it's more beneficial this way than if we were to list the reverse. So that's just, uh, anyway. So the, just uh, so uh, to re as a reminder, that attachment has an exclusion and ex inclu inclusion. And like there, it says excluded, included, all the issues are there. Okay, These well. These issues are in there, but this is shorter, more concise. You could just and, see it right there, yeah. Okay, and I think it's helpful to see what's excluded. I, mm -hmm. I do not have a strong background in family law. So, you know, Steve Ham Stephen Hamilton is the person who can speak to that, but I, I understand both sides of the concern over long-term marriages, but I will say if there's any way you can draft this in a way that does not, that would allow the types of clients that Elizabeth is referring to, who really there is no source for support, they wanna close the door on this and be done with it. If that really is the majority of what she's seeing, I would, love that we could meet what Stephen's concern is and what Elizabeth's concern is mm -hmm. jointly. That's mm -hmm. my- I have to say sense. that's what we mostly see at the South Park Center and Family Law Facilitators Office. People who don't have a long-term spousal support issue, they just wanna, uh, they just wanna terminate it. Can I um, share what the um, standard language is in marital settlement agreements for people who are doing this now? Maybe that, maybe we can use that terminology, put that in this motion that says that the paraprofessional would have to put this language in any agreement that is submitted for presentation for the court to finally sign off on. Um, I can read what that language is if you guys thought it was helpful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So again, I'm looking at the time. I've got to cut this off and I've got to take a vote because we have other resolutions. Well, I think you need to hear from Judge Wiley, who's had her oh, hand up for a while. I'm sorry, I don't see a hand. Sorry about that. I, I just want to say just really very quickly, you know, I've been looking at this word um, all in the in the uh, first sentence of the pair of the uh, resolution. And maybe if we take out the word all family matters, because there are, clearly we are excluding um, certain family matters. Um, I think that would be helpful in the drafting. Okay. 
and then I'm, I'm, I'm happy with um, the language that we currently have right now for the uh, long-term support um, simply because we can still, you can still reserve and it doesn't implicate this. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm satisfied that we've, we've done what we can just in terms of making it clear and, and drafting. Well, as the mover also, um, Fariba, if it doesn't take too long, I'm happy to hear from Elizabeth the language she's suggesting because, I mean, you know, we can always see we can make it better. Elizabeth. Thank you. Um, so right now it says, all right or claim to receive spousal support from the other is hereby waived by both of us and no court will have jurisdiction to award spousal support to either of us at any time, regardless of any circumstances that may arise. We declare that we have carefully bargained all issues related to spousal support, including the amount and its duration. We understand that either of us could ask the court to retain jurisdiction over the subject. And we understand that this waiver cuts off forever any right of either of us to ask for or receive support and the power of any court to order it. We understand that this clause could work great and unexpected hardship at some time in the future and that we have considered that possibility in the making of this agreement. We are aware that if requested by either of us, the court is required by law to reserve spousal support for long-term marriages of over 10 years and may be disposed to do so for marriages shorter than 10 years. Even so, both of us waive the right to receive spousal support now or at any time in the future, the end. And this is a template created by an attorney given to, um, it's NOLO Occidental and that LDAs use to prepare these MSAs. Thank you. Thanks, Elizabeth. That, that's really helpful to give concreteness to what goes on day to day. But um, I think I'm just going to leave the motion as I made it with the changes that are on the screen. But thank you. Thank you. Last minute comments, last chance. OK. Yes. Uh, I beg your pardon? No, no, no. Go ahead. OK. So a motion is on Carolyn. <laughs> Uh, super quick, I brought in, um, I brought up at the consumer debt meeting uh, the other day how much I pined for the simplicity of the Utah uh, language. And I'm just looking at the Utah language right now, and it has um, 13 exceptions. And one of them is uh, representing an Indian tribe member. I don't know. There's a bunch of them here that may be worth looking at, and maybe we could do amendments to the end. Um, but um, there's a lot of little things in here in Utah that they've thought about that we haven't looked at. That's all. Okay. Should should we try to take a vote, Fariba? Yeah, that's what we I have was a motion and a second. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Second. All right. Uh, uh, Bashan, I think that Sharon is not here. Uh, Brendelson. Yes. Falmouth. Yes. Fleischman? Yes. Hamilton? Yes. Judge Harper? Yes. Hartston? Yes. Kirkmeyer? Yes. McRae? Yes. Olvera? No. Robinson? Yes. Judge Rubin? Reminder that Judge Rubin's not here. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, um, Shining? Yes. Uh, Sarush? Yes. Spiro? No. Torres Ambriz? Yes. Judge Wiley? Yes. Judge Yu? Yes. Thanks, Linda. Motion carries. Okay, I'm going to jump in for just one moment before we move to the next one, because I'm going to be transitioning to my phone as I need to start driving towards a medical appointment that unfortunately had to happen this afternoon. So I'm uh, deputizing, for lack of a better term, Judge Yu to take on the role of chair for the remainder of the meeting, and I thank her for that, and um, I'll be continuing to listen and hopefully participate by phone. Okay, so let's move on to the second part of the uh, resolution, um, oh. which is in court representation. That's where um, my confusion lies in, in because of what I brought up at the beginning. Oh. Is there something that should be on a PowerPoint that you want us to see? 
Yes, I think Linda's working on it, right? I, I um, had not understood that it, it wasn't the full motion that was on the screen. So that was well, just- We only the, voted on the substantive issues. Now we're gonna vote on the full in, on, on in court representation. Oh, so not on the first, so the further resolved here was not included in that resolution? No, not the way I describe it. Yeah, oh. I'm sorry, that was not part of my motion. I just meant the first resolution, I'm sorry. I got that. it, okay, yeah, okay. Okay, so how are we gonna address this? Um, uh, could, could we make it bigger first of all, and then sort of have us give it a chance to kind of look at it again when we can so see. Fareeb, if I understand it, this is the motion put forward by the working group and you today are proposing an alternate motion. Yes. Yes. Yes, so originally uh, we agreed on, limiting full in court representation uh, by leaving out um, hearings on emergency custody and visitation orders um, when children are at risk, basically. But my motion was to um, eliminate full in court representation and just limit it to being at the table as support and answer uh, procedural questions from the court. Steve has his hand up. Oh, Steve, yes, thank you. Just you. I'd like to get a reality check from the judges. Because there's no fee caps, we're going to have paraprofessionals representing people who could afford lawyers. And I just wanna get a reality check. How are those hearings and trials going to look when you have an attorney on one side and a paraprofessional on the other side? I know how hearings go when you have an attorney on one side and a pro per on the other side. And different judges handle that imbalance differently. I know I'm asking you to predict the future, but can you just give me a reality check how that imbalance is going to play out in real life? Because I'm concerned about it. Well, well and, and I think you're assuming that there's going to be an imbalance. I, I think that one thing that we should all consider is that there may be some care professionals um, who may actually be very better advocates, uh, better writers, better legal researchers than the attorneys that appear in front of us. Um, I, I, you know, because I, I think that that for me, at least in, in what I do is a very, very real possibility. Um, I think that one thing that I, that I hope to see in the future is that there will, the court hearings will become a lot more efficient. I won't need to explain some of the more basic fundamental issues uh, to a paraprofessional as I would to a self-represented litigant. And so just having someone who has some knowledge of the process, um, some substantive knowledge uh, at, in, in the hearing, um, helping manage client, a client, um, I think will be hugely beneficial. Um, you have to, again, Remember, seventy percent, and that's you know that that is not an overly generous number. Seventy percent of what we see are people who come into court and represent themselves, so they have zero information, zero knowledge uh, with respect to um, some of the issues that we're then expecting them to advocate for themselves on. Um, so, from my perspective, I think um, you know it, it will be a vast improvement in terms of what we're seeing now. But Judge Wiley, when you have an attorney and a pro per, my experience is many judges bend over backwards to give the pro per the benefit of the doubt. And what I mean is, you know, the document wasn't filed. It hasn't shown up in the clerk's file. Um, they're going to continue the hearing, give them another chance to file it, that type of stuff. Um, if a, I understand your point that paraprofessionals may be as good or better than attorneys. I get that, but um, I still see the potential for, in, for a perception of imbalance by some judicial officers. And I'm just, I'm just wondering how that plays out in real life. Then perhaps I'm not, I'm not necessarily understanding your question because um, as I see it, it it's, it's more of a balance. It's not necessarily an imbalance. I think the imbalance is an attorney and a self-represented litigant. That's an imbalance. Um, I agree with that. 
but more of a balance. The premise of what I'm saying is the paraprofessional will be representing somebody who otherwise could afford an attorney. And so two attorneys going against each other, I, you know, that happens all the time. We know how that plays out. I'm asking you how a paraprofessional against an attorney is going to play out. Uh, point, I'm sorry, point of order. Uh, Steve, pardon me, but th this is a back and forth and we've hardly got any more time and a lot of people, other people might want to talk. All right, go ahead, whatever. Okay. Um, I, I, and I have to, uh, uh, Amos, uh, Claudia, uh, you're going next, but I just have to say that my, I agree with Judge uh, Wiley and I agree with Steve, both positions. Uh, my concern is the cost. That is, if we empower them, authorize them to do full in-court representation, there's not going to be cost savings because, yes, some power professionals would be much better <laughs> than attorneys out there. Okay, Amos. So I, I obviously agree with the concerns about the costs and no cost limitations, but I think we separately dealt with that and voted on that. And so I'm just looking at these two proposed resolutions that are very different. And I certainly respect what you're saying, Fariba, but I'm very interested to know if this has been considered and if we have a recommendation from the full subcommittee on this, because this is a very important and controversial issue about in-court representation mm -hmm. that, um, you know, I, I think we need to fully consider this, but I really would like to get the recommendation or understand how this discussion went at the at the subcommittee level. Yes, Steve made this, um, no, actually Steve's motion was no in court representation, right Steve, at the subcommittee meeting. And it was three to three and it failed, I believe, because of the typo. Uh, but I believe our meeting um, uh, was before the fee caps, if I'm not mistaken, or we didn't discuss the fee caps uh, consideration and the cost um, issue. Uh, any members so of the that, subcommittee? Does that mean that it, the committee is evenly split on, on this, or is that not clear? I think that was the vote, but I may be wrong. Dana, your hand is up. Did you, do you remember? I guess I am also seeking to use Mr. Fleischman's words, a reality check, because I thought the default position from the larger group was in court representation and each subcommittee could stray from that. But our subcommittee voted for the resolution, not the alternate. And I'm, I guess I'm unclear as to why we're at this group trying to undo the subcommittee's work. Because the fee, because of the fee cap issue and the uh, cost increase by uh, empowering power professionals to be equal to attorneys, the cost saving goes away. And I'm really concerned about that. That was not. That wasn't part. Certainly not. Part I know of it wasn't part of our discussion. I know that. And no, we could I, have another I, meeting. I really wanted to have another meeting. Fariba, as what the deputy vice chair, I feel like you're arguing and saying something um, that we've heard already, and there are hands up from people who haven't said anything. So can we get some other in points of view? Oh, I was just responding. Yes. Um, I don't see any hands right now. I thought I saw Elizabeth's hand up. My hand is up. Okay. Oh, well, did you and then Elizabeth? Elizabeth was up before me. Okay, Elizabeth. Um, so just to um, mirror what Dana said, um, I am a little bit confused as well because um, I want to, I agree with in-court representation, like the whole working group had decided, and this is news to me that we're putting a motion yeah. And so I would have liked to have a discussion being one of the members of the family subcommittee just wanted to express that instead of being, um, you know, blindsided, not having the opportunity to prepare. But the one of the main reasons why um, we have to do this uh, in court representation, because regardless of the fee cap issue wasn't addressed or not, it still doesn't change that the people need the assistance. Um, the other thing is that as paraprofessionals, the more so, uh, you're able to give us the power to um, negotiate, there's going to be less in-court representation necessary. So that's what I always keep going back to, like give us the tools to negotiate, to write correspondence, to give legal advice so that we can keep all of these matters out of the court system. Um, that's it. Thanks. 
Also, Fariba, I had seen Miss Claudia Ambrise's, uh, Miss Claudia Torres Ambrise's hand up way before mine, but then it went down. I wasn't sure if she wanted to say anything before I said anything. Okay. Just to make it clear, Judge, uh, Claudia, if you just give me a second. I made the clearest my motion, not the subs committee's motion. I wanted to get us back together, but I was told timing wasn't right because we have to do notice and we have to do this and that. And I asked for I asked if it was okay to make a new motion that's not in the memo. I did not mean to blindside anybody. I, I think I was clear that this was my motion and my, my concern and I could not be at peace with myself if I didn't mention it. Just wanted to make it really clear and I have respect to keep everybody informed. Claudia. Oh, thank you. So my my hand was raised back when Mr. Fleischman was positing the situation of somebody that could afford a lawyer but chose to be represented by a paraprofessional then facing another attorney. Um, but then, then he said whatever and went off video and said nothing. So if, if that's no longer on the table, then I don't have a question for him. Uh, Can't answer any question, Claudia. Okay, thank you. So my question is, um, I don't recall having had any like income stipulations for who can use a paraprofessional. Is that correct? Uh, at this time, I could be a wealthy person who chooses to use a paraprofessional and nothing prevents me from that. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Why would I choose to do that? If I could afford a lawyer, yes, like in, under which situation does this um, versus exist? You're on mute. I can't hear you. To save money. Claudia, I've had okay. it all the time where people who have the beans want to represent themselves because they're anti lawyer and they don't want to. They want to do it on their own. They've done their Google research and they found that model for a marital settlement agreement for 50 states that they want to use. And frequently, those, those are the ones, those are the judgments that get set aside ultimately because of um, either inadequacies or errors in the marital settlement agreement or an unequal division of the assets and debts. It is folks mute. I think I don't know who that I is. I am at the yeah. center in Silicon Valley. I have to tell you, a lot of folks choose to represent themselves and uh, come to the self help center and use our settlement office or services that are free. Um, so it's just a matter of personal choice. Um, but Fariba, it's kind of counter to the argument you're making. You're saying that because they'll be able to be in court, they're going to charge as much as a lawyer. Uh -huh. And if there's so that then that is runs counter to what Steve is saying that people would choose a paraprofessional versus a lawyer because paraprofessionals will cost less. No, no, I'm so, talking about the middle income and low, uh, the, the, the group of people we're trying to reach to close this gap in justice, gap in service, access justice, gap in services. I'm not talking about people who could afford to go either way. I'm just talking about, about the group of people that we're trying to reach. And this is gonna cost too much with that group of people to not be able to hire paraprofessionals to help them out. That's, I hope that's clear. Um, so- uh, I, Four hands up, yes. I, I'd like to make the motion. Um, and go with what the committee itself discussed and not Ms. Uh, Sarusha's own personal motion that she made at the top of the meeting. I also wanted to say, I kind of, I really get what Claudia is saying that, you know, people are gonna be able to make informed choices. You know, if they can afford a lawyer, then maybe they'll go with a lawyer because there's gonna be disclosures that are required through the regulation committee. If they are wealthy and they can find a paraprofessional that they think does a great job, then let them hire the paraprofessional. As long as there's disclosures, they should be able to make that decision. So I'm making the motion for what's on the top of the screen, which is what the committee has recommended. And, and if I can clarify, it was not a tie vote. This was a four to two vote for okay. the first one. I know we took two different votes. The second right. one we have. But, right, there was a different one where it was split, but for this one, for whether 
in court representation should be excluded altogether. It was a four to two vote. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, Linda. I'll, I'll second the motion. Uh, Judge Wiley. And then I have Elizabeth and Stephen and Linda and Judge, you know, your hands are up as well. No? Okay. Elizabeth and then Stephen Flashman. No, sorry, it was up from our dear. Okay, then um, Stephen. I just wanted to know if Claudia had any further questions. If not, I'm ready to vote. Okay. Oh, thank you, Stephen. Um, no further questions. I'm since I'm not wealthy, I'm I'm still processing this saving yes. money from a wealthy person's perspective thing. Um, but thank you. And, and and Judge, you made the motion, and who seconded? Uh, Judge Wiley. Judge Wiley. Okay. Okay. Great. All right. Could we take a vote, please? Yes. Um, Reynoldson? Yes. Falmouth? Yes. Fleischman? No. Hamilton? No. Judge Harper? Yes. Hartston? No. Kirkmeyer? Yes. McRae? Yes. Olvera? Yes. Robinson? Yes. Ted Rubin? Oh, sorry. Um, Shining? No. Sarush? No. Spyro? Yes. Torres Ambriz? Oh, yes. Judge Wiley? Yes. Judge Yu? Yes. Thanks, Linda. The motion carries. All right. Moving on to the next one. Uh, we are now in violence prevention. Could we put the first resolution up? Yeah, yes, just a moment. So the first resolution is um, easy. Uh, we're uh, proposing that uh, the paraprofessionals be uh, authorized to provide representation all violence prevention matters. You've read the memo and you know what the different uh, violence prevention orders we're talking about. Um, I'm, I move that uh, the group adopt this resolution. You have a second? Second. Uh, who seconded? Dana. Dana, thank you. Any discussion? Questions, discussions? All right, I don't see any. Oh, uh, Julian. Oh, uh, thanks. Sorry, for your did me, did, uh, me or her? I'm no, sorry. Julian's hand is up. Did you have a question too, Julia? No. Oh, okay. Go ahead. I just want to know what I'm voting on. Are we just voting on this first thing, the first thing that says resolved? Yes. Okay, thank you. Well, the well, further result or further result is about in court representation. So we're going to take that on next because there's two versions. Well, Linda, right. you may not want to scrap them because we're going to vote on those next. Yeah, just highlight what we're voting on right now. Just the first paragraph. Yeah. Any other questions? Discussions. All right, let's take a vote, please. Okay, hold on a minute. I'm just. <laughs> oh, sorry about that. Don't mean to rush you. Okay. Oh wait. <laughs> Talk amongst yourselves. Uh, so. Oh, Ira. You know. Um... I'm in favor of this, but I think it's a little vague. Shouldn't we define uh, violence prevention matters? It's a specific procedure, isn't it? I mean, there's all kinds, there's a- Different types of restraining orders, domestic violence, civil harassment, workplace violence, um, gun violence, other abuse. So perhaps just like the 
did we end up in the first one in family law attaching attachment a or no i forget we referenced attachment a we referenced so it's in the same document perhaps maybe we should add that linda i make right. a friend friendly amendment i'm sorry judge you have a point yeah i are you talking about the first resolution that we talked about? I thought we had referenced attachment B. Right. Right. So I'm saying maybe we should do that here with regards to uh, violence prevention matters to clarify what they are. So um, um, I accept the friendly amendments. Does the second accept it? Or would yes. Okay. 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 Uh, Julian, is that a new hand or from before? I'm sorry, you're talking to me? Yes, do you have a question? Yeah, no, no, I'm sorry. I, I'll oh, lower no my... problem, no problem. Okay. Whenever um, you're let, ready. Oh, Carolyn has a question. Yeah, I, I just, I'm going to be a broken record, and so I'll keep it short. Um, again, in the Utah version, they just say, I think, temporary restraining orders, they just say domestic violence. If we have to put in here all this verbiage, we're making a mistake. When you acknowledge that excluding jury trials, except if you have experts, then accept cross-examining. I think that um, acknowledges the massive problems with the way we're doing this full in-court representation language. I just think we've We've um, we've killed this. We've brought a, a sledgehammer. I mean, these are real problems. These are real problems. I've done this. I've been in these hallways. I've been in these courtrooms. I know this is a problem. I can't abide by the way this is. This language is just anyway broken record. I apologize. I just are want to explain. My, I just want to explain my no votes. Sure. Are you talking about the language as highlighted? Um, no, I'm just talking about the whole thing. Just get okay, it out so of the way. If I could ask you to keep your comments are really valuable just if it's about the second piece of it just hang on what uh, what are your comments about this the piece that's highlighted that's what we're voting on same comments yeah i don't you know how do you what is all why do you strike all what does that get you in english in violence representation prevention matters it's all i just delineate it it's just who is writing this are we writing this or somebody we don't know writing this in, it's just in no, I mean, attachment B to the previous memos, um, then A to the first one, then B to the second memo, it lays out the violence prevention matters that we're talking about. Yeah, I, yeah, See, I, I'm not my, sure my, that it does. I think it just says violence prevention. But that right it, on top, it says domestic violence, civil harassment, gun violence, won't place violence. Okay. Linda could also just list just those out. In the, yeah, we could vote. We could list them out as well. So, I think there was a motion and a second, and we're running out of time. And this was, you said, the easy one. <laughs> just take a vote. Do you want me to list out the, the different areas? Okay. I think since we referenced the... <laughs> Let's just okay. stick with the reference. Okay. If uh, it was already moved, so if we're changing okay. the language, you okay. gotta change the motion. Okay. Yes. Okay. Brennelson? Yes. Falmouth? Yes. Fleischman? Yes. Hamilton? Yes. Judge Harper? Oh. Yeah. Yes. Hartston? Yes. Kirkmeyer? Yes. McRae? Yes. Olvera? Yes. Robinson? Yes. Shining? No. Sarouche? Yes. Spiro? Yes. Doris Ambrise? Yes. Judge Wiley? Yes. Judge you. Yes. Thanks, Linda. The motion carries. All right. Thank you. So with regards to the in-court representation, um, 
I, uh, the second resolution, the alternative is uh, uh, the position uh, that is consistent with the vote we just took on the uh, family law representation. That is, we excluded full in-court representation when um, uh, when emergency visitation orders are at issue because there are children at risk. In every restraining order, I'd say 99% of the judges can disagree with me, but in my experience, every uh, violence prevention order, DV, includes that includes children between the parties, children are always at risk because there's domestic violence. There's always emergency custody visitation orders attached. And often at the first hearing, emergency custody visitation um, hearings are conducted. So I believe that the second resolution is consistent with our vote in the family law, uh, uh, issue, under the family law issue or topic. Uh, could I get some comments from the subcommittee members, please? Which, which one of these further resolved is the recommendation of the subcommittee? The first, well, it's split. Uh, the first one is, I believe it's three to three. Steve, Sharon, and I are supporting the second one. But again, when the subcommittee, full subcommittee supported the first vote, would exclude it emergency custody station hearings from full representation is consistent to vote for the second resolution here. I don't understand because um, every custody visitation hearing involved in a domestic violence matter involves emergency custody visitation issues. Uh, so Fariba, is the difference between the two further resolves the issue of when there's children involved? Is that the only difference? That's the only difference. So why don't we just have maybe a little discussion about why there was a split in your committee so the rest of us can understand the thought processes. Sure, that's what I was uh, asking for my subcommittee members to comment about this. Well, I, I voted for the, the first um, for the resolve uh, and because I, I, I think most of the cases that we do see uh, involve children and some of the issues, you know, for, for most of us, we have a family court services that will do a mediation with parents um, prior to a restraining order, restraining order hearing. Um, we'll always have review hearings after restraining order hearings um, on custody visitation uh, issues and orders. Um, and so I, I see very little risk to having paraprofessionals participate um, in that process. Uh, so that's the reason why I voted to um, agree with uh, the first resolution. I, I think that paraprofessionals are completely capable of, of addressing these issues and helping the court. And Judge, I'm just going to again point out that in the first resolution, we specifically as a subcommittee excluded emergency custody visitation because we determined that paraprofessionals should not be handling those issues because it's outside of their training. But now you're saying this is within their training and not in every county at least in my county, there's not going to be mediation before a domestic violence hearing. And there's almost no review hearings just because of resource issues, but I can't generalize. Um, any other subcommittee? Or, or did you want to respond, Judge Wiley, before I ask? No. OK. Other subcommittee members? Before, I know, Carolyn, you have a comment. I just wanted to invite Steve. Uh, Dana, anybody else? Elizabeth? I know the reason why I recommended the second further resolve was due to the issues that come up with Family Code Section 3044 and the evidence that needs to be produced to address the presumptions against a parent who has been found to have committed acts of domestic abuse either against the other parent or a new domestic partner. And um, I just did one of those hearings. It, it is more involved. And my concern was that it would go beyond the scope of the education and training that we have proposed, which is basically a one-year timeline between education and experiential time. And that we specifically adopted so that we didn't put as big a barrier as say Washington did is to create our paraprofessionals. I think the scope of what's necessary to successfully do that type of hearing 
is beyond the training and experiential requirements that we've adopted. And the children, and Judge Yu, I know you have your hand up. The children are uh, very much at risk, if not more, when there's domestic violence involved. Yes. So Steve, when you say 3044, I'm not sure everyone knows what that is. And my understanding is that there's a presumption if there's a finding of domestic violence against one of the parents, that um, that presumption can be overcome, but it, it makes it harder for them to get custody and visitation. Is that what you're referring to? It is, I'm double checking to make sure I didn't say the wrong code section. No, it's the right code it's section. The presumption against joint legal and physical custody and oh similar to 4320 factors, which is the spousal support pack factors, um, they're very clearly articulated. For example, um, you can rebut the presumption if you've done a 52 week batterers course. So either you have or you have not. Um, so that counseling, you know, their uh, drug treatment. Yeah, that, that, things are, are fairly routine. Thanks. I just wanted to make sure that people understood it that I understood because then Steve, if, if I understand 3044, because I did the criminal side of domestic violence and had to advise people before they took pleas, how does that make it more complicated such that a paraprofessional couldn't handle a domestic violence proceeding? Um, for me, it's the it's what happens before the hearing and what you have to counsel your client about. Remember, the paraprofessionals could be helping the abuser, not just the victim and understanding what that's required and the knowledge of the case law that exists out there with regards to overcoming 3044 presumptions and when it's not there. It, for me, it was, I know how long it took me to learn those things and what I've done to be prepared to address it on either side of the 3044 presumption. And I did not feel that the education and experiential requirements that we um, have adopted were sufficient in light of everything else that you're going to be learning. And this is such an important law. I mean, we have a public policy in the state of California for a finding against the sharing of, of legal or physical custody if there is that finding of domestic abuse. And I, uh, Claudia's hand is up just one moment. Uh, Joju, is that a new hand or from before? Yeah, okay. So I just want to point out to those of you who don't practice family law is that at the domestic violence hearing, which is what we're talking about here, 3044 is raised if there's a, uh, a finding of domestic violence, rebuttal actually does not happen on the same day at the same hearing. It actually it happens at the custody visitation hearing, um, which paraprofessionals are authorized to handle. Um, and I'm talking about at the hearing for the domestic violence restraining order and often includes emergency custody visitation orders attached to the restraining, temporary restraining order. That's where we're at right now. Uh, Claudia. Yes, thank you. Um, I want to give special thanks to people involved in this subject, this committee. Just listening to you all, my blood is boiling, not because of what you are doing, but because of the subject matter. This is one of the subjects that I think people really need help with. It is such an emotionally charged situation. So I'm reading this resolution and if somebody could explain to me what this means, unless the client provides informed consent, I feel like that's something that's very important that can change the outcome of everything. What does that mean in this case? What do I, the client, what am I agreeing to when I provide informed consent? So we've been kind of discussing informed consent the regulations committee and basically informed consent means something is not allowed unless the client actually signs off and authorizes it. So without that, the paraprofessional cannot do what is stated here. Um, Ira, you hand your hand. Is it, a, Ira, are you responding to this? So, uh, sorry, still on the same thing then. Um, okay, my concern is, uh, I'm the client. Mm -hmm. I want to get this over with. I just want to go through whatever legal things I have to get through so that it's over and I can move on with my life. Mm -hmm. Am I in the right mindset to be able to give consent at this point? Because mm -hmm. I feel like maybe I'm not in the right mindset here. Maybe 
I give up consent and I allow somebody to represent me or, or to give expert witness or to cross-examine people just so that it's over because I just want it to be over. Sure. I'm concerned okay. here about allowing that specific um, witness testimony being introduced. I'm concerned here. And what would you think? Um, I mean, that's a very valid comment. What would be the alternative that would make you feel more comfortable? I don't know, take out informed consent, just not allow it? Because I, I think as much as I trust the ability to, of, of any person to be able to understand things if they really want to, mm -hmm. I don't know that it's in the best interest of the client to then allow the paraprofessional to go there. I, I feel like this is the one thing that I may actually want a more more trained because I, I, I was on the <laughs> on the committee where we discussed how many hours I was with you right there Steven so I know I know we really tried to do the most with the least amount of time right yeah. but mm -hmm. I, I feel like it's um I don't want to I don't want to take the chance of getting the one paraprofessional that's not super invested and informed in this one subject and then them introduce that uh, I don't know. It's... Okay, so you would want to uh, take out uh, uh, the the ability for the client to do, uh, sign an informed consent. Just in this one okay. violence prevention thing, and and just because I know that even when you have a bunch of therapy, you still may not make the best choices in that subject because honestly, you just want to get it over with. It's um. If I can talk to. The I'm constantly dealing, because I typically represent the victims. I can think of two cases in 26 years where I was representing the accused and constantly dealing with issues of PTSD, constantly avoidance or what, you know, ostriching, putting their head in the sand because they don't want to be brought back to that bad place that they were. So I'm not offended by the suggestion that that informed consent provision be removed. I also agree. Uh, I think it's a very serious concern that uh, uh, litigants uh, who are survivors of the misappropriation often are not in a position to make rational decisions, especially surrounding litigation on a domestic violence restraining order and uh, uh, custody issues regarding their children. Ira, um, I judge you. That sounds true to me, uh, but I, I wonder what I'm thinking is if uh, clients like that are not in a position uh, to be able to make uh, good decisions for themselves. Why are we focusing on um, this one really narrow question about whether a paraprofessional can can uh, introduce or cross-examine an expert witness? Uh, that seems this principle seems to apply be way way broader than that. And it also occurs to me that if the client is having a paraprofessional represent them in one of these uh, uh, proceedings that uh, all it does is um, narrow, uh, it, it make their chances of, of, of getting what they want in the proceeding worse by not letting the paraprofessional do this examination or cross-examination. Um a uh, good question. I'm going to invite the uh, uh, Stephen uh, to comment. Uh, Judge Wiley, um, the recommendation, the suggestion wasn't from me, so and, and I don't litigate. So, <laughs> it, I would think in most of these instances, if you're bringing in an expert witness, and it doesn't happen that often, I would say less than three percent of the domestic abuse cases will that happen. That means somebody has money to be hiring an expert witness and bringing them in. And as a result, the other side, so I'm, I'm gonna talk from the victim's perspective, they should be getting a fee order and getting their own experts and having an attorney representing them, not a paraprofessional. So my question, my issue is couldn't the expert be a police officer? Cause the police officer may have responded and then the someone might say, well, you've had these 
X number of cases as a police officer that you've investigated and try to qualify that person as an expert. So are we saying that a paraprofessional wouldn't be able to cross-examine an expert, a, a police officer, about the number of domestic violence cases that police officer got? I'm just, I'm thinking that when we say expert, we're not necessarily meaning someone who's like gone and gotten multiple, multiple um, degrees such that a paraprofessional wouldn't be able to, you know, uh, properly represent someone or, or question or cross-examine. Anytime I've had an officer involved, it's going to be a precipient witness. And I can't think of a single case where a police officer is qualified as an expert witness in domestic abuse and been allowed to offer expert testimony. I'll defer to the judicial officers. If any of you ever qualified a law, I see Judge Wiley shaking her head. No, that would be my expectation. Right. No, that would be very rare. That would be very rare. And, and when we're talking in this context, it really, you know, it's, it's more of an expert, um, usually an academic who would come in and testify with respect to battered women's syndrome or some other very, very nuanced uh, issue within the case. And so it, the, the chances, and I've never had, I've never qualified an expert in, in a DV hearing or trial. So it's extremely, extremely rare. Okay, thank you. I think I've been handling too many motions to suppress in drug cases. <laughs> <laughs> the officer's always an expert. Okay. So uh, I'm gonna, uh, there are no hands up. I'm gonna move that the full working group adopt a second resolution, ask for a second. Uh, Stephen, you're... Um, I'll second, but I'll make my own suggestion for a friendly amendment. I want to adopt Claudia's language and strike from the comma unless the client provides informed consent, period. I agree with that. Okay, so we have a motion and we have a second. Any uh, discussion? So which, which, which one are we voting on? Yeah, which one has highlighted? Uh, Julianne. Um, yeah, Fariba, at the very beginning of this discussion, you said that to be consistent with the vote that we just took on family law matters generally, mm -hmm. we would need to vote for the second option here, the one that is highlighted. Mm -hmm. But exactly, can you point out what part of the first general family law resolution that we approved is inconsistent with with the with one or both of these further resolved under violence prevention sure 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 uh, so for in full in court representation yeah. portion of the family law subtopic um the bullet says uh the exception is hearings on emergency custody and visitation requests okay so it's that oh, okay so that's consistent with domestic violence hearings involving children because in domestic violence um, hearings, uh, there's always emergency custody visitation issues because of the incident, incident of domestic violence between the parents. That's domestic violence cases with children between the parties. Thank you. That's, okay, great. Any other? Questions, discussions before we take the vote is 307. We're eating into the housing committee's time. Okay, could we take a vote, please? Yes. Uh, Brennelson? Yes. Salma? Yes. Fleischman? Yes. Hamilton? Yes. Judge Harper? Yes. Arston? Yes. Kirkmeyer? Yes. McRae? No. Overa? Yes. Robinson? Yes. Shining? No. Sarush? Yes. Spiro? Yes. Torres Ambriz? Yes. Judge Wiley? No. And Judge Yu? I'm going to vote no, because I, I didn't think we should include the thing with the children. 
Thanks, Linda. The motion carries. All right, so moving on to adoption. Again, I think that's straightforward, but what do I know? Okay. Bringing that one up. Thank you, Linda. Um, maybe you could make it a little larger and then highlight the first resolution, please. Okay, I'm just gonna read it. Resolve that California Power Provision Program Working Group recommends that power professionals be authorized to provide representation in uncontested adoptions with the following exception, adoptions arising from dependency petitions. Uh, I move that the full working group adopt this resolution. Do I have a second? Second. Who seconded? I did. Oh, judge you. Okay, great. Thank you. And Carolyn, you have a comment? Yeah, I, when I saw this, I was, again, I was pretty stunned. I didn't think this would be part of family law. And um, I just, I, I, I happened in COVID time to listen to a friend give a webinar on adoption and was phenomenally shocked at how complicated it is, especially with international issues. Um, all you know, I would say 95% of adoptions are uncontested. So accept that there's so many, I don't know, where did this come from? Why did this get in here? Uh, please, can someone from the committee explain how this came from family law? So the official name of this group is Family, Children and Custody Subcommittee. So it will include adoption and conservatorships and guardianships and child welfare issues as well. Um, as Stephen, you have your hand up. So in mo in all of these adoptions, there's uh, with the possible exception of the step parent adoptions, which are covered by these, in all of these adoptions, there are extensive investigations that are conducted uh, as part of the adop adoption process. So the, the concerns that we would have about a paraprofessional facilitating adoption that would not be in the best interest of children is, is really remote because of the investigation process. And then uh, also, Fariba explained, although the adoption may sometimes be handled in probate court, it's done on a county by county basis. And sometimes it's the family court that's processing the adoption. So that's, we were the logical place to put this specific issue. I just, that begs the question, who, who did you, I didn't even know this was happening or I would have brought a couple of friends in to testify about it. Who, did you have people, uh, attorneys who do uh, um, adoptions come and talk to your committee? I'm, I'm sure you must have, but multiple, multiple we that out multiple in the memo. Sorry. experts. Yeah, we laid that out in the memo um, in terms of the experts we spoke with. Um, Elizabeth also um, contributed a lot. Uh, it's very form intensive. There are judicial counsel forms. And, and uh, Carol and I do adoptions every Monday. Um, they are they're, they're fairly standard routine affairs. Either the Human Services Agency or the Department of Children's Services will do the investigation. Um, and there has to be a report and consent of that agency before the adoption is finalized. So again, one, it's, it's a fairly standard procedure. Hmm. I see one person listed, Robert Walmsley. Is there anybody else? Whatever uh, stayed in the memo is accurate. Mary Feldman was mentioned. I thought on some- Mary Feldman just spoke to us about uh, dependency. Oh, okay. She didn't talk about dependency adoptions and how come they should be taken out. Um, I'm I, not sure, but you know, I think she was mentioned in the memo. Yeah, I don't remember. She's mentioned the memo. She talked to us about dependency. I don't remember if we decided to exclude adoptions from adoption uh, from uh, consideration. 
because it's in juvenile dependency, just in general, we're staying away from juvenile dependency. And Judge, you, if I'm not mistaken, um, there's right to counsel yeah. in those cases. So, you know, there's no need, right, for part yeah. of it. So that's why we- well, Except for what Mary mentioned, which is siblings, grandparents, et cetera, which is what your memo also addressed. Right, in the JV 180. Um, uh, yeah, and we're gonna discuss that. But um, uh, Elizabeth, did you have me? Yeah, your hand is, I was just gonna ask you. <laughs> So, I mean, I know that and when we were having these discussions, we were talking about certain exclusions in addition to this, and one of them was like the ICWA, the Indian Welfare Act, and so maybe it would help if we add that here now, um, and also maybe exclude the, to say, in international, um, based on Carolyn's um, suggestion. That's all I'm um, saying, thanks. Okay, um, let me, before we address that, Steve, do you have your hand up? Just now, you have a comment? Old, I forgot to take it down, my apologies. Okay. And then Ira, and then Judge you. Sorry, I don't understand the difference between the first one and the further resolved one. Uh, the first, the, the further resolved one says full in-court representation. The, but the first one doesn't say anything about limiting the representation except for the dependency. Well, the first one about doing out-of-court out work, like forms and legal advice, the second part is just about in-court representation, appearing in court at the Whoa. hearing. I never that. thought that when I looked at it. Um, and that's how we were doing the other ones. Did you? Did you? Um, so with respect to ICWA, it, mm -hmm. it probably makes sense to include ICWA. And then with respect to international adoptions, I thought that some of those were done by agencies in the United States, and I'm not sure they're necessarily more complex, so I wasn't sure why they should be excluded. And I will say you're, you're correct. Um, agencies in the United States has to be the sponsoring agency. I'm um, taking the place of the uh, governmental agency that handles the investigation and dependency. They also have several both pre and post placement reports um, concerning the prospective adoptive parents and the child. Uh, that they do need to file with the court. The court then has additional findings to make as a result of the adoption, um, but the court will ensure that the information has been provided to the court uh, by the paraprofessional. So I, again, I, I agree they are not uh, any more complicated uh, than a regular adoption. Oh, uh, Judge, you, what did you say about ICWA? Elizabeth suggested adding ICWA cases, you know, like adoptions that might um, uh, have an Indian child where ICWA might be triggered. And so I was just supporting what Elizabeth said. To exclude them or to exclude them? That's what I understood Elizabeth meant. Okay, so you're supporting. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and um, I would be amenable to an, uh, a friendly amendment to add that um, and who was my I judge you well you were my second. Can we just yeah? Can we just um, explain what that means to those people who may not um, know what ICWA is? <laughs> Go ahead, judge. Okay, there's the Indian <laughs> Child Welfare Act, which I know because I was in dependency, and um, we I think some of us know about the shameful history of the United States where Indian children were removed from their families in the United States and in Canada, specifically to deny them really a full experience of their cultural heritage. And so ICWA was put in place to make sure that um, if a child is identified as being a member of a tribe, that tribal members are first um, able to adopt the child if they're available and, and, and it all is appropriate according to the court's um, supervision. So it is relatively uh, tricky to understand ICWA and there's a lot of case law on it. So I think it probably does make sense to carve those out, but I would defer to Judge Wiley or those who do it in the family context because I've only done it in the dependency context. Um, I think I, I agree because there's a, there are a lot of noticing provisions that have to happen. You have to notice the tribe. The tribe then has an opportunity to join or intervene uh, in the adoption process. Um, and I would point out um, tribal customary adoptions um, take that take place. 
um, they do not terminate the parental rights as we do here in California. Um, so the rights of the parents in customary tribal adoptions are maintained and the child simply gets an additional set of parents or family. Um, so that's a, a quite a distinction that we, we may wanna consider. So I, I, I agree that the adoptions should exclude uh, any ICWA. Thank cases. you, Judge. Amos? Uh, I'm comfortable with that too. I do have a question because uh, I think my adoption experience is also in the dependency court uh, where I think the usual issue is whether or not the child has, uh, there's a potential claim. So in, in other words, all adoptions are potentially <laughs> involving the, the uh, Indian Child Welfare Act because I think the fundamental question is an investigation or determination where there might be some claim that an Indian tribe might make. Um, so I just don't know in practice if that happens outside of the dependency context as well, if one of the uh, agencies does that investigation or not. And I, that's a good point. I have as the second, a friendly amendment that we would say um, in the yellow, uh, the exception would be adoptions arising um, where the child has been identified as um, being protected by ICWA. So that way it doesn't include just every case where there's an investigation. Okay, and I agree with that. Is that accurate the way it's written? I think so, yes, judge you. Yes. Okay, good. And Ira, oh, thank you, Judge. Ira? Yeah, if if uh, this resolution is meant to authorize uh, only out-of-court uh, out representation, I think it, it ought to say so, because I thought it meant any kind of representation. So authorized to provide out-of-court representation. Okay. We don't have that in any of the other resolutions, but sure. I mean, I, I don't think it... Oh, maybe the others should change. <laughs> no problem. Uh, Judge, you, do you? I, uh, I guess I accept that. Okay. All right. Thank you. Are there any other comments for discussion? Okay. Seeing no hands, could we please take a vote? All right. Uh, Brennelson? Yes. Falmouth? Uh, yes, and I think you need to change the term to exceptions um, in the very first huh. preamble there. Just, thank you. Thank you, Julia. Thanks. Um, Fleischman? Fleischman? Stephen. You still here, Stephen? Oh, he's not here. He's not here. Okay. Um, Hamilton? Yes. Uh, Judge Harper? Yes. Hartston? Yes. Kirkmeyer? Yes. McRae? Yes. Olvera? Yes. Robinson? Yes. Shining? Abstain? Sarouche? Yes. Spiro? Yes. Torres Ambriz? Yes. Judge Wiley? Yes. And Judge Yu? Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, moving on to the second resolution about in-court representation. The resolution is that California Power Professional Program Working Group recommends well, that- In the interest of time, I make that motion. Thank you. <laughs> second. <laughs> Do I have a second? Second, oh. Judge Wiley. Judge Wiley, thank you. All right. Oh, okay, hold, hold on a second. I have to bring up a voting slip for this one. Oh, sorry. So, and who was the motion? Uh, Judge, uh, you made the motion and Judge Wiley seconded. Any discussion? Do we need to add the part about Indian Child Welfare Act, the same thing to this one? I, well, well, I, I think if, if they already if we... Yeah, so that's why I was wondering, is that is that clause, except for those arising from dependency positions, is, is that even necessary? Because yeah, that's, I don't that's think an it's excluded necessary. activity. Okay, yeah. thanks, just checking. Thanks. Yeah. Um, Judge, do you accept that amendment? 
Yeah. Okay, good. And uh, Judge Wiley as well. Okay, great. I see a thumbs up. Any discussions, questions, comments? Uh, Ira, is your hand up? Yes, go yeah, ahead. Yeah, I'm trying to, I, I, I don't think these, ex <laughs> it's my fault, I guess, but I don't think these two exclusions are uh, excluded anymore the way the first resolution is worded. First one says out of court representation with two exclusions. Second one says in court representations. But what about the exclusion? I think you have to read them together. And it is, um, I think that's why Linda was suggesting earlier that you, you were voting on both of them together. Yeah, I, I know. I wasn't my first motion, but as the movement of the second motion, uh, maybe we could put some language. Well, it says further resolved. Um, maybe further resolved within the parameters set forth above or something like that. Well, uh, so I, I've added this language except as excluded above. Okay, yeah, that I, I think that's works for me. Judge Well, thank you. Yes, uh, thank, you. thank you very much. Any other? I don't see any hands. Could we take a vote, please? Uh, yes. Um, Reynoldson? Yes. Thelma? Yes. Fleischman? Yes. Hamilton? No. Uh, Judge Harper? Yes. Hartston? Yes. Kirkmeyer? Yes. McRae? Yes. Olvera? Yes. Robinson? Yes. Judge Rubin? I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, Shining? No. Sarouche? Yes. Spiro? Yes. Uh, Torres Ambriz? Yes. Judge Wiley? Yes. And Judge Yu? Yes. Thank you. The motion carries. Thank you, everybody. So finally, oh, oh no, not finally. <laughs> Child welfare. Okay. Okay, so the first resolution is about the pre-filing stage uh, where the parents, uh, to put in context for you, where the parents have to uh, be in contact with um, Child Protective Services, something has come up, a petition hasn't been filed, but there's a lot of activity going on. And I have to tell you, in our office, we see a lot of families in this stage where they're just lost, they just need some help to navigate the system, talk with the social workers, get the information, know what they're doing, get ask, access to records and so on. And Mary Feldman, uh, who's a local expert, uh, she also agreed that this is the stage where there is just a huge gap in services and it could make the difference between a petition being filed and a family participating in informal reunification services, for example. I know we have several judges here who um, have handled uh, dependency, and um, I ask you for your comments um, and suggestions and members as well of the subcommittee. Um, but I move that the full work group adopt the first resolution as stated on the screen. Do I have a second? Bariba, I'm wondering if we could do both the first and the second together. Together. And if so, I second that. Okay, uh, one moment. So the second one um, mainly will involve petition or a request for a change. It's the form number, judicial council form number is JV180. This is after uh, some orders have been issued and, and judges who've done dependency, please feel free to correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, this is what we see here in our office. Often involves parents who want changes in orders that have been made and the parents no longer are represented but it could involve any interested party, such as siblings, relatives, any interested party to file a request. Uh, Mary Feldman explained to us that the right to counsel kicks in at the first hearing uh, for parents and the children involved, not necessarily for non-parents. 
for other interested parties. I checked with another local expert, Hillary Cushions, yesterday, uh, just to confirm that that once the form is filed and there's a hearing set, the process, the very first hearing is almost automatic that the court will appoint counsel to parents. But help is needed to uh, fill out the forms and uh, because those parents are often emotional and we've seen them. So not very functional. Uh, and that's why that resolution is there. Before Amos, I uh, call on you to, to address your question. I wanted to know if our committee members, judges who, special judges who have, who handle dependency cases can comment on either of these resolutions, please. Well, the second one, because I don't think you have, you come across families in the first one. <laughs> Uh, I do um, some fair amount of dependency as well, and there's, and I agree, there's just a, a tiny gap uh, in terms of before the court is able to appoint an attorney. And, and, and once you're in court, once a detention has been made, then everyone is entitled to counsel up to and including appeal. So there are just a very few, both pre-filing and post dismissal when someone wants a change of court order, uh, that representation would be needed. And so we've identified the work group has identified those two uh, time periods. Thank you, Judge. One, one concern I have is I do dependency cases as well, is, is for an attorney to appear in a dependency case, there has to be specialized training, proof of that specialized training for them to, for an attorney to come into it and represent. Um, I, I don't know if that's been addressed in any part of the discussion or in the licensing or is that in order to do a dependency case, they're gonna to have to have some specialized training. Right. So I, I just wanted to say that there's gonna be for, at, uh, for the JV 180 is the only place we are um, considering allowing paraprofessionals to appear. And again, my understanding is once they make it to the hearing, the process is relatively simple be, uh, to get um, an attorney appointed. So as soon as that right to counsel kicks in, the paraprofessional is out. Am I right in that? And does that take a lot of training to, to you know, the portion? So, so you're talking about, so a sibling wants to do a JV 180 in order to have visitation rights. They're not entitled to counsel. So that paraprofessional would have to have specialized training to come into court. It's not that that sibling is not going to go or that grandparent, they're not going to get appointed counsel no. Right. So that was my second question for non parents. How often do you see those cases? And I know the right to counsel is not automatic, but is it prohibited? I mean, can you appoint counsel? I don't know what other counties do, but <laughs> we do not appoint counsel for those. We don't have counsel available for, for those. Correct. It's a, it's a budget issue. And so it, we, we typically will not unless and until um, we're, we are required to. So, and in, in terms of the question, uh, other parents, whether there are other individuals, um, very rarely happens, but sometimes it does. You know, it, I, I can't quantify that. Um, okay. Probably less than two or three percent. The other issue too is Child Welfare Services already has an obligation to look for family to place a child outside of foster care. So um, there is an obligation on child welfare services to look for a sibling or a parent or grandparent, um, someone in the family to, to place. So I'm, I'm not quite sure what, um, what the purpose of this would be. You're specifically referencing the second highlighted resolution, Judge Yes, Parker. yes, the second highlighted. Thank and you. to your first question, um, this group gets to set the educational requirements. Mm -hmm. So if you believe, and I, I think that's accurate, that specialized um, dependency training would be warranted, then that's what would be part of the educational requirement. Mm -hmm. um, and so we have Amos, Julia, and Dana in that order. Thank you. So I agree it's very specialized and um, maybe not needed because there's not that many gaps or there are small gaps. And because of the specialized training that would be required, um, you know, I oppose this. Um, I also note that um, Children's Law Center just sent a letter um, really asking to be heard, raising concerns and say, asking not to vote on this, but to be able to present why uh, dependency was not an appropriate 
uh, area for a paraprofessional program. So I encourage us uh, to defer this to allow, you know, the subcommittee to hear more about concerns raised from legal services and dependency council about uh, paraprofessionals going into this area. I just want to clarify that this part, the second part of this resolution, the second part for the result, we are talking about out of court work. We're talking just about the form. It, uh, the in court representation is the second piece of this. So are you saying, Amos, that you don't believe form work should even be done? Because if JV 180 is as simple as family law forms, I and mean, it's just setting forth what you want and why. Yeah, I mean, I believe consistent with what I believe the Children's Law Center would like to be heard about is that dependency requires very specialized training. There's already a right to counsel, and this is not an appropriate uh, place for the paraprofessional program and, and just time to be heard from experts in dependency on those issues. Okay, Ju uh, Ju uh, Julia and then Dana and then Stephen and Judge you. Um, I, I would also like to mention that in the licensing subcommittee, unless Stephen recalls it differently, um, we have had discussions that if we have too many different things that are just very small pieces, they are going to be difficult in recruiting instructors for the program because they're just going to be a small whole of, of education requirements in that subject matter. And if we have to get a very specialized person to do that, and that's exactly what they do, I just, I, I think it's going to be very hard to recruit educators to do something that is so finite, so small, and yet how to compensate them for preparing and doing that. So I can, I can see in the, I don't think we've contemplated this in licensing as one of the things I was discussing uh, even before uh, Claudia came onto our subcommittee, but maybe Stephen remembers it differently. But I, I think from an instructional standpoint, this, this may be too small of a pigeonhole to be able to recruit educators to come and, and teach and even have institutions that will fund such a small class of, I don't even know it would rise to one unit, but if it requires such specialized training as judge, has it, it's, Hartzett has said, I just, I, I just really think that we're, um, this might, might not be well suited for this uh, program. Okay, thank you, Dana, and then Steve, and then Judge you. Thank you. So um, it's eight hours is what the Welfare and Institutions Code requires before you can do anything as a practitioner in dependency law. You can get it all online. So if, if this passes, I would think that we'd have to have that and then specialized training for the, and I agree with Julia, these are little pieces. And when we first started this work, at the very beginning, I said I wanted dependency out altogether. I practiced in this area. It's highly specialized. It's like the, the equivalent of the death penalty when we take people's children from them. And I didn't think it was appropriate, but we heard a lot from a lot of people that there are these little pockets where assistance could be provided, particularly the first resolved. That is where people could get some really dedicated help when they are being threatened with the removal of their children. And they could come up with a safety plan and they could have safe homes and write it all down. If this happens, I will take my children here. And that to me is extremely valuable. But I see the, the wisdom of people saying, it's there, these are little pockets of specialized training. I don't think finding educators will be hard because there are hundreds in county council's office all across the state who would love to come and help in this area who practice nothing but dependency. Thank you, Stephen. I'm gonna kind of take it in parts. With regards to the first paragraph, part of what that's capturing is a parent's right to obtain CWS or CP, CPS records for matters that did not go to a dependency case. It is a crossover into family law cases where you need to get the results or the safety plan or get information from the agency that's unrelated to an actual dependency petition. So that's part of what that was trying to capture. 
that was a, a change in the law maybe four or five years ago where parents now had the right to go get those records, whereas before you had to go through an 827 petition, uh, Welfare Institutions Code 827 petition to get those records. So that's part, that's more of information gathering and that's why I'm not worried about number one. Number two, it is referring to people who are not parents who do not have their parental rights at risk. Every parent that is in family uh, independency court has an, uh, a right to, to appointed counsel that are meet the criteria, the education and training requirements that um, uh, uh, was brought up by Judge Harper. This is having to do with what if the child had an extensive relationship with their grandmother or their grandfather and they are not being included in the dependency process and they do not have a right to free counsel or representation. Their options could be, if we're dealing with the lower income people, their options could be try to do it on their own or get assistance from a paraprofessional. And absolutely, Julia is right about that. This is gonna be tricky in terms of the education, but this might be where we get one, in, one entity that does do an online training course or a, a on-demand training course to cover that. And again, if the education doesn't materialize, which is a possibility, then no one's gonna meet the criteria for it. I think it's the rest of this that's not highlighted that is the, the primary concern of having paraprofessionals being hired in lieu of court appointed attorneys representing a parent in dependency. And we're not to that resolution yet and uh, won't be anybody surprised that I'm gonna be arguing for the last resolution, not the third resolution. But as to these first two, they're really narrow in scope and practicality based on the, the descriptions and explanations I just gave. Okay. I just wanted to share that um, I think there's also going to be bench officers who would be willing to do some training um, on this as well, and maybe social workers, and that it is online or that, you know, piece, if it's little snippets because we're filling pockets, maybe those could be put on video and then sort of played as part of a larger class. So I, I don't think training will be that difficult because I know there are definitely judges who have expertise in this area who'd be happy to train. Thank you, Judge. Uh, Julia, I think you have a new So problem. then my question is, is Stephen, do you see it being able to fit into being a part of uh, the licensing that you have structured for family law whereby you could take one unit out of one of the items that you have contemplated for the family law practice area. And we could, when developing curriculum, perhaps envision that the, that that curriculum could fulfill what Judge Harper was saying about having this certified regimen of training that could be you know, folded into one of one unit of something that you've already contemplated for family law? I almost, I'm gonna be evasive, but I think maybe the, the re response is, or my response is, there probably should be a dependency endorsement that's separate from family law endorsement. But that's my problem. It's gonna yeah. be very, very hard to get community colleges and other programs to invest in curriculum and instructors who are going to offer such uh, small uh, subject matters. Now, if we could get the eight hours into something dealing with family law so it could become part of the family law uh, practice area, I'd be willing to work with that with you. So we might be able to do that because I think, I think that if we can include what is Judge Harper was referring to and what Judge Yu was referring to as being the standard that the, the bench would uh, honor as proficient and qualified to do this work, we could perhaps find a way to weave that into, you know, the family law practice area, but I would like it to stay in family law if I'm going to recommend this. And then perhaps we would just have to revisit some of the licensing requirements of family law. But I, I would just have a very hard time trying to sell this as a complete, uh, justifying why they're gonna do all this other stuff to not get a family law endorsement and just do this one thing. 
Julia, um, I'm, I'm going to interject because Linda and I just had a long meeting yesterday where we went through for each of the practice areas using the family law um, educational requirements as the benchmark, not including in that family law educational requirement dependency, conservatorship, and guardianship, and coming up with a recommendation to bring back to the licensing subcommittee about how to... Um, address all of these other practice areas. And so I think your concern is gonna be addressed by what we're gonna to propose to you guys. Okay. Um, and so I think that shouldn't be the basis for your vote. I would just encourage you to think we can work that part out and okay. focus on whether or not you think it should be included. And hopefully okay. we can take a vote because it would be great to at least get through family law today. <laughs> Thank you, Leah, that assures me a lot. That's exactly what I needed to hear. Okay, Amos. Thank you. So um, I very much appreciate that the Family Law Committee will be considering in the future what educational requirements should go along with this. But again, I think that goes along with the request from public, including the Children's Law Center, that they have not yet been heard, both on the educational requirements that would be necessary, as well as you know, the reasons why they would oppose or have real concerns about this. So I, I would like to see the Family Law Committee um, you know, allow for, hear from interested members of the public in the child welfare system before we vote. Uh, did you? Um, so I, I am aware that Mary Feldman was a practitioner in dependency for a very long time and then became um, the director of the pro bono project in Santa Clara County. And then I think she's in private practice because she's doing dependency again. So um, I think she's very well versed about what the concerns might be. But if we um, do need to uh, put it off for more input, you know, I understand that. I'm just sort of hoping that we can move forward so that we um don't waste time and i'm kind of wondering why dear uh amos uh you know this is a public meeting we didn't hear any comments from that group so are you suggesting that we delay it again and invite them or something no i i think we did hear public comments they were in writing uh, and i think they were just submitted on june 8th right and I think written comments count Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So to the extent that any member of this committee wants to vote against this or um, or also want to delay, that's fine. Uh, I'm, I, did, we ever, did we do uh, a first and a second on this? I forget now. <laughs> I don't believe so. Okay. So if most members want to continue discussion on just the child welfare piece, I would not be opposed to that. And Madam, uh, Madam uh, Chair Pro Tem, I'm not sure, but I heard her say that she wouldn't be opposed to that. Um, so what is, uh, how should we proceed? I'm here? hoping that we wouldn't need it, um, that you know Mary Feldman's uh, credentials would be enough because it would just cause delay and have to schedule another meeting, but I'm not opposed to it. Okay, I understand. Any other comments on, on this issue? We did hear, so we, we definitely had negative comments about including any pieces of dependency in writing from more than one group, which we did consider. And Fariba, you did move the first resolved and I said, can we take the first two together not knowing it was gonna create this kind of a <laughs> And um, I'm fine with that to take both of them together. This is outside of court work. I just wanna make it really clear. And I'll move those two highlighted motions. And I second. Okay. Um, any further discussion? I don't see any hands. Okay, let's take a vote, please, Linda. Yeah. Reynoldson. Yes. Bellman. Yes. Fleischman. No, I'd like the committee to hear from more stakeholders. Hamilton. Abstain. Uh, Judge Harper. No, I'd like to hear from more people as well. Hardston. No. Kirkmeyer. Yes. McRae. Yes. Olvera. Yes. Robinson. Yes. 
Shine, oh, uh, I think Carolyn had to leave. You still here, Carolyn? Um, Sarush. Yes. Spyro. I abstain. Torres Ambriz. Abstain. Judge Wiley. Yes. Judge you. You know, if there's enough abstentions because people need more information, I would normally vote yes, but I'm going to vote no because I'm getting a sense people need more information. It's your motion. <laughs> I know, but I I want to I want to honor how people feel. Of course. What oh, how many knows the motion that? carries? We have eight yet in favor, oh. uh, four against, and three abstentions. I agree with Judge you. I said yes initially, but if that's the feeling of the body, I want to honor it. So you're changing your vote? Yep. Um, to abstain. OK. Four, five, six, seven. So now we have seven in favor, uh, four no, and four abstentions. So it doesn't carry. Right. Okay. I believe that's the case. I don't know if um, abstentions uh, have the same weight as a no vote. I was just looking up Robert's rules of order. Okay. And I don't know if, if Brady, if you're still here. So can we, if, if Erica, if you're withdrawing your motion, I'm willing well, to respect that. Well, we vote. Okay, so we also have to check if we voted. I'm not sure I can um, withdraw a motion once it's voted on, though, Julia. Okay. Um, yeah, but thank I you. think that if I think that it still carries if, if the majority are in favor. So maybe what we can do just so we can move forward is um, maybe for Reba, you can schedule a family law meeting, you can invite Children's Law Center to come, and although it's not ideal, if the uh, subcommittee wants to bring back a modified recommendation, then you can do that. Okay, that? ask for an input considering that this probably carried and what they would uh, how would they advise us to go forward from there? I'm yeah. really open to that. Can, we can always bring back in another recommendation at a future meeting. Sure. Well, I, Linda, I looked it up. What 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 was the count again? Hold on a second. Okay. Sorry, I just seven in favor, four against, four abstentions. Then the motion doesn't carry because the more majority didn't vote yes. Okay. okay. All right. So we will consider this at a later time. I ooh, 10 minutes. Can we take on conservatorships and ooh, the oh, we have to get to this the in court representation. For I think at this point, if everyone agrees, especially Judge you, we should table the entire issue. Yeah, we should. Okay. Yes, we didn't take a yeah. break today. So right. Yes. We didn't take a break today and um we'd we'd we just be rushing through. So Okay. So we have conservatorship and guardianship. We can hold off on those and wait or we can try to take them out up to you no <laughs> let's go round two at a well, later date yes at a later date okay and finally uh, i was asked to mention that the regulations committee is taking on the issue of required disclosures and uh, 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 asking subcommittees uh, whether they want special disclosures for their specialization. So this being family, um, I think since we didn't take a break and we've had a full day, I'll just put that out there. Family, we'll take the issue of required disclosures up at our meeting where we're going to be discussing um, child welfare. And that's all I have. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for your participation. But Leah and um, Linda, do you have anything you want to add before we break? No, just... I have a question for Leah. Yes. What is the plan for the meeting on the 25th? I'm probably, I'm not going to be able to attend. Oh, that's a, a meeting that you're interested in. It's the rules meeting. Yes. But you submitted the comments and we have those on the recent draft, but that's what we're uh, primarily focusing on on the 25th. We're also bringing back governance uh, the licensee name. It looks like we'll have to try to squeeze in conservatorship and guardianship and housing. 
So it'll be a pretty busy um, agenda. Do you want do you want to try to do housing now? I think it's a pretty simple issue. If ever, it's just about lean clearing. Well, sure. I would love to, but I want to respect uh, others feeling tired. I think it's simple too, but who knows? Maybe not. Who knows? I know. <laughs> So does so it sound like we get to have another meeting then, Leah? Well, um, I think we could fit it in. Um, we can try to fit it into our, we have a meeting scheduled, I believe for June, July and August. So we'll be able to get it in. If somebody wants to make a motion on the housing resolution, we could always do that now. The resolutions are in the memo. And Otherwise, I have it here. We'll squeeze it in to an upcoming meeting. So I can just briefly summarize that. I think this is something Ira had taken up and, and other members back last June. It has to do with just clearing any liens that are on property. It's not a um, issue of um, quiet title. It's, it's really not a, a in-court issue. It's just if someone has any liens against their property, a paraprofessional could uh, then help them clear any liens on the property. Um, who moved? Second. Seconded. I'm sorry, who, who moved? That's you. And who seconded? Dana. Julia. Oh, both of us, Dana. I'll arm wrestle you. <laughs> <laughs> That'll okay. be the first Zoom arm wrestle. <laughs> okay. Are we ready to vote on this? Iris got his hand up. Yeah. Um, the, uh, the, the last, the third to last line, second to last line, I mean, represent people in other matters relating to home ownership. That's a that's way broader than we meant, isn't it? It says prohibited from. But our prohibited, oh, I'm sorry, okay. Call the question. Okay. Uh, Reynoldson. Yes. Falmouth. Yes. Fleischman. Yes. Hamilton. Yes. Ed Harper. Yes. Hartston. Yes. Kirkmeyer. Yes. McRae. Yes. Olvera. Yes. Robinson. Yes. Sarouche. Yes. Firo. Yes. Torres Ambriz. Yes. Judge Wiley. Yes. Judge Yu. Yes. Thank you. Motion carries. <laughs> Yay, a nice way to end Good, good job, Judge Harper. Harper. Thank you. Yeah, good call, Judge Harper. And I wanted to say a little back, Elizabeth, good good call on the ICWA as well. Um, and also, I know, Leah, all of us are just so pleased to know that you're going to be here for the long haul. Uh, and so congratulations again. And thank you, everyone. And thank you so yeah. much. For Congrats, Congrats, and your congratulations, whole Leah. Yeah. Committee. Thank you, Freeva. Congratulations, okay. Leah. One, Thank one second, Erica. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Judge, Judge Harper. You. Judge Harper, an issue came up on housing unlawful detainer. Has anyone filled you in about the limited jurisdiction issue? We're going to have another meeting here soon. We're trying to set up a date now. So uh, I don't know if I've been told about that issue in particular, but if you can, then we're, we're going to have a meeting probably Real next Real simple. Week. In my opinion, it should be limited to limited jurisdiction. I was under no, the it impression. It is that issue. We, that that is issue. the reason they're having another meeting. Yeah, okay. Okay, thank so you. Yeah, we'll address that in the next couple of weeks, yeah. Okay. Bye, thank everyone. You. See you soon. Take Bye, it. everybody. Like Bye. your dog, dog yeah. judge you. Thank you so much. Bye, Julia. Bye. 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 <laughs>